Secrets of the Paleozoic Era 538 million years ago, ancient life began to flourish on Earth. The Paleozoic Era began to emerge. This era began 538.8 million years ago and lasted as much as 287 million years. The Paleozoic Era was divided by scientists into six periods. Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian. Paleontologists around the world are trying to unravel the mysteries of the time. They use the most modern equipment and supercomputers capable of solving problems at space speed. Scientists, like professional detectives, study finds that are several hundred million years old and such work gives interesting results. This is what scientists think the revival of life on our planet looks like. The appearance of the Earth during this period has before continued to change. Mountains rose and fell under the water, the climate changed, Life either developed rapidly or experienced new catastrophes. We present you the most formidable hunters of the Cambrian period. Dinacarids. Some representatives of this species were more than a meter in length. Dinacarids were the most vigilant and fastest creatures of the Cambrian. But with weapons, these creatures clearly went too far. Grasping appendages, despite their formidable appearance, were not as strong as pincers and by themselves could not inflict damage on the victim, but only attracted prey to the mouth, which was located on the belly. Another genus of large tree lobice, Red Lichia. This animal could boast that it had the first jaws. Other inhabitants of the oceans could eat only with the help of suckers. Red lichies could gnaw on shells, which means that the hunter's diet became more diverse. Another predator lived the end of the Cambrian period. Sedia. Giant crustacean scorpions, the largest arthropods in history, are descendants of the Sedia. Sedia, thanks to revolutionary weapons, would be dangerous even for a person. Where is Dinacarids and predatory trilobites? despite their intimidating appearance, could not cause harm. After the Cambrian came the Ordovician period. The variety of animals of the time increased many times over. Endoceras were giant cephalopods with a long, straight shell that reached a length of up to four meters. Although there is data on individuals up to eight meters long or more, was one of the largest Ordovician animals. But for all its massive dimensions, Endoceras fed on plankton. The structure of the beak of Endoceras was too primitive to eat even small invertebrates. Camarasaurus, another giant mollusk that lived in the oceans of the Ordovician period, the shell of Camarasaurus reached a length of 9 or 10 meters. Together with the tentacles, this mollusk should have been 11 meters long. This giant monster was also a plankton feeder, like most modern whales and some species of sharks. Graptolithina. These were colonial organisms, which in the early Paleozoic constituted a significant part of the plankton. Ancient organisms appeared in the middle of the Cambrian period, existed in the Ordovician and died out only in the early Carboniferous. The body of Graptolites was a colony of creatures vaguely resembling modern jellyfish. Graptolithina were abundant in the early Paleozoic, especially from the Ordovician to the Devonian. It was these creatures that formed the basis of zooplankton in the ancient seas, being passive filters that were carried by the current. Some Graptolites attached themselves to floating organisms. In the seas of the Silurian period, 420 million years ago, a powerful development of invertebrates continued. Particularly rapid and versatile development is observed in corals, trilobites, brachiopods, cephalopods, crinoids, and other groups of animals. The groups of horseshoe crabs and eryptorides have reached great development. Perigotus, due to its huge size, Perigotus was the most successful predator of its time. This Eurypterida had powerful claws with which it grabbed and held prey. 
such as trilobites or primitive fish. Flat fin-like hind limbs helped Perigotus to swim well. Perigotus fellow Eurypterus was much smaller, an average of 20 centimeters. But the largest individual discovered was more than one meter in size. Eurypteruses possessed spine-bearing appendages and a large oar, which they used for swimming. These animals were versatile species, equally prone to predation or carrying. And this is a Eurypterid called Carcinosoma. Carcinosoma had walking appendages with spikes that were used to create a trap to capture prey. There was also a giant Stylonorus, reaching three meters in length. These Eurypterides led a predatory lifestyle, feeding on fish and various invertebrates. Stylonoruses had four pairs of legs. The limbs of the animal were long and powerful had spikes and were capable of locomotion to a lesser extent, swimming. Astraspis is a primitive vertebrate of the Ordovician and Silurian periods. Such creatures lived 450-440 million years ago in the lagoons and shallow seas that washed North America. The front part of the body of Astraspis was covered with a strong shell, consisting of dorsal and ventral shields. The rear half of the body was covered with strong scales, and probably ended in a tail lobe. There were no other fins and astraspis did not swim well. In the early Silurian, a group of small fish, the so-called echinthodes, arose, which became the first predatory fish on Earth. The name echinthodes means prickly the fins of these fish were attached to hard spikes. Perhaps in order to make it more difficult for predators to swallow ancient fish. The Devonian period has begun. The fourth geological period of the Paleozoic era. During the Devonian period, creatures that did not have a backbone continued to develop in the same way as before, although the rate of development was not the same as in the Silurian. But a large number of fish with a heavy, hymard head appeared. Armored fish, or as it are also called placoderms, are quite difficult to meet in our times, but then a large number of fish of this species lived on the sea plume, in lakes and rivers. The Devonian period was the time of the greatest cataclysms on our planet. Europe, North America and Greenland collided with each other forming a huge northern supercontinent Larisia. Wide swampy deltas formed, which created ideal conditions for animals that dared to take the first, so important steps from water to land. Devonian jawless fish agnates did not have real jaws and teeth. Skeletons of these fish were not bony, but cartilaginous, but most of them cover a bony shell. Astricoderms, similar to eels, swam freely in the water, filtering it or sucking in small organisms. Most of the astricoderms were small, but some species, clad in a thick shell, reached a length of 1.5. Only a few jawless fish have survived to this day. Lampreys and mixins, long eel-like fish. The creatures did not have any traces of a bone carapace, or even bone plates. These species were predators. Lampreys mainly parasitize other fish, and have sheets to sheet the coats of marine animals that sink to the ocean floor. In the Devonian period, ferocious predators of Dunkleisty appeared up to three meters long. In the upper jaw of these giants, instead of teeth, there were rows of small plates. Constantly in contact with the lower jaw, these plates sharpened its edge so strongly that the fish could bite and crush the prey with both jaws. Massive armored heads of Dunkleists flexibly articulated with the body, and the monsters could open their mouths and tilt their heads back. Dunkleistia filled lakes, rivers and oceans, hunting for prey that was previously too tough for any predator. 
The length of the entire body of adults ranged from four to six meters with a mass of at least one ton. At the same time, evolution gave rise to even more highly organized predators. These are sharks. Ancient sharks with wide fins and streamlined bodies rapidly cut through the waters of the Devonian seas. The sharp teeth of sharks were constantly replaced by new rows growing behind the old ones. Shark relatives, rays, silently glided over the sea floor, hunting for unsuspecting fish and shellfish. Simultaneously with sharks, an even more promising group of fish, bonny fish, began to spread in the seas. Astixia. Most modern fish belong to this group. In these fish, in the process of growth, cartilaginous skeletons are replaced by bone ones. Astixia have two pairs of fins, pectoral and pelvic, which helps them move more easily. For example, these fish can bend, turn or break. One of the famous sharks of the Devonian period. This is Staticant. Outwardly, Staticant resembled a shark 70 centimeters long. The dorsal fin of this fish had a modified shape, resembling an ironing board. On the fin, as well as on the head, there were small spikes. At the end of the Devonian, many groups of fish became extinct, as did numerous families of corals, brachiopods, and ammonites. The places of extinct creatures were occupied by new species of animals that appeared already in the next Carboniferous period. You will see about the Carboniferous period and other interesting times of the Mesozoic era in the next issue. Carboniferous period the climate of that time on most of the Earth's land surface was almost tropical. During the Carboniferous period, the oxygen content in the Earth's atmosphere more than doubled, reaching 35. In the Devonian period, the oxygen content was 15%. Today, the amount of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere reaches 21. The marine fauna of the Carboniferous was characterized by a variety of species. The foraminifer that lived in that period were not animals, plants or fungi. The remains of these creatures even today form huge Cretaceous deposits. From these deposits chalk is taken which is used in all educational institutions around the world. Schwagerins appear in the middle Carboniferous. The globular shell of the creatures was the size of a small pea. From the shells of foraminifers of the late Carboniferous limestone deposits were formed in some places. Well-known corals began to form huge reefs during the Carboniferous. At this time, Echinoderms developed intensively. In particular sea lilies and sea urchins which occupied four of all genera of the Carboniferous. Brachiopod mollusks have developed very much. Productus enriched the Phenia. Cephalopods such as nautiloids or thosaurus, cerchosaurus, belemnites, ammonites flourished in the Carboniferous. The first terrestrial gastropods appear, animals that breathe with lungs. But there was a problem with trilobeds. In the Carboniferous period only a few genera and species of these first animals survived. By the end of the Carboniferous period, trilobeds had almost completely died out. This was facilitated by the fact that cephalopods and fish fed on trilobites and consumed the same food as trilobites. The body structure of trilobites was imperfect. The shell did not protect the belly. The limbs were small and weak. Trilobites did not have attack organs. For some time they could protect themselves from predators by curling up like modern hedgehogs. But at the end of the Carboniferous fish appeared with powerful jaws that gnawed at their shell. Therefore, from the numerous type of trilobets, only one genus has been preserved. In the seas and rivers of the Carboniferous lobe fin fishes were strongly pressed by cartilaginous fishes. The group of ancient sharks also belonged to the lobe fin fish. Ancient sharks were not much like modern sharks. Eugeniodons were the most numerous order of ancient sharks. 
The most interesting feature of this detachment is the dental spiral. It was a long soft outgrowth on the lower jaw, studded with teeth and usually coiled. Eugeniodons were large fish from 1 to 13 meters. And the Campidus shark even broke the Dunclistus record in size. Adestus, also known as the scissor toothed shark and coal shark. The remains of Adestus were found in carbon deposits of coal. It's another one of the prehistoric sharks that has given paleontologists a hard time trying to understand their fossils. The 6 meter Adestus belongs to the same ancient family as the Bazaar Helicobrin and also shares its unique tooth shape. A relative of Adestus is the well-known Helicobrican. The body structure of this ancient shark remains unknown. Helicobrians could eat fish. The second large detachment of Carboniferous sharks is the Simorids. The third and last worthy of mention detachment of Carboniferous sharks is the Xenocindida. They were moderately large predators from 1 to 3 meters. Sharks bred intensively. This eventually led to the overpopulation of the sea by these animals. Many forms of ammonites were exterminated. Solitary corals which provided sharks with easily accessible nutritious food have disappeared. The number of trilobites has significantly decreased. All mollusks that had a thin shell died. Only the thick shells of spirifers did not succumb to predators. The products have also been preserved. Animals defended themselves from predators with long spikes. The vacant niche animals began to be occupied by small fish similar to modern chimeras but more diverse. In addition to these main classes of fish, smaller fish existed in the Carboniferous class of ray fin fish and acanthid. In the lakes of the Carboniferous period, arthropods appear, including 17% of all genera of the Carboniferous. These are crustaceans, scorpions, and insects. Insects that appeared in the Carboniferous occupied 6% of all animal genera. A wide variety of fish lived in the freshwater basins of the Carboniferous. Some of the fish jumped along the muddy shore, like modern jumping fish. Fleeing from enemies, insects left the aquatic environment and settled on land first near swamps and lakes and then mountains, valleys and deserts of the Carboniferous continents. Carboniferous insects were the first creatures to take to the air. Insects did this 150 million years before birds. Dragonflies were the pioneers Tsimuidsi. Soon the dragonflies became the kings of the air of the coal marshes. Butterflies, moths, beetles and grasshoppers followed suit. The abundance of oxygen in the air allowed these creatures not to form a normal respiratory system. Insects continue to use poor trachea and feel no worse than other terrestrial arthropods. Dragonflies were the only extensive detachment of Carboniferous insects. Representatives of the smallest known species of insects were 3 centimeters in length. The wingspan of the largest insects, for example, Stenodictia, reached 70 centimeters. The ancient dragonfly Meganevra had a span of up to 1 meter and its body weight roughly corresponded to that of a modern crow. Meganura's body had 21 segments. Six segments made up the head. Three segments chest with four wings. Eleven segments abdomen. The terminal segment resembled the styloid extension of the trilobite tail shield. Numerous pairs of limbs were dismembered. With their help the animal both walked and swam. Young Meganeurs lived in the water, turning into adult insects as a result of malting. Meganeura had strong jaws and compound eyes. The six-winged Paleodictyoptera and the flightless Blattopera. Similar to modern cockroaches, also lived in the Carboniferous. The second large class of arthropods of the Carboniferous were arachnids, 
This class includes three different orders of normal spiders and one order of scorpions, arachnids of carbon reached very large size. The record one including the tail belongs to the scorpion Pulmonoscorpius. Another species of arthropods that became very numerous during the Carboniferous is the Snokas. Dyspnoi and Upnoi. These creatures were quite advanced at a time when spitters and scorpions were still at a fairly early stage of evolution. Horseshoe crabs, starting from the Ordovician, dragged it out a miserable existence in the shadow of trilobeds, and the Carboniferous multiplied strongly and captured about half of the ecological niche of trilobeds. Eurypteridus began to give up their positions, but very slowly and gradually. Some of these creatures reached a length of up to 2 meters. Centipedes also gradually lost ground. Although the huge Arthropura reached a size of up to 2 meters. In the upper Carboniferous period ancient insects died out. That descendants were more adapted to the new living conditions. Orthoptera in the course of evolution gave termites and dragonflies, Eurypterus ants. Most of the ancient forms of insects switched to a terrestrial way of life only in adulthood. These creatures bred exclusively in water. Thus, the change from a humid climate to a drier one was a disaster for many ancient insects. Among the insects of the Carboniferous period, there are no bees and butterflies. This is understandable since at that time there were no flowering plants whose pollen and nectar these insects feed on. For the first time, animals breathing with lungs appear on the continents of the Carboniferous period. The life of amphibians is closely connected with water since they breed only in water. The warm, humid climate of the Carboniferous was extremely conducive to the flourishing of amphibians. These skeletons were not yet fully ossified. The jaws had delicate teeth. The skin was covered in scales. Scientists named these ancient amphibians Stegocephals. Stegocephalians inhabited shallow lakes and swampy places near the coast. Some of the amphibians may have stalked prey half submerged in water. In the manner of today's crocodiles. Perhaps such animals were like young salamanders. These creatures were formidable predators with hard and sharp teeth, which grabbed their prey. Most animals had four legs with short toes. Some creatures had claws that allowed them to climb trees. Legless forms also appear. Depending on the way of life, amphibians acquired triton-like, serpentine, salamander-like forms. Perhaps many of them spent their entire lives buried in the mud. Microsaurs were more like small lizards with short teeth which were used to split the shells of insects. Towards the end of the Carboniferous period a new group of four-legged animals appeared in the ancient vast forests. They were mostly small in shape and in many ways resembled modern lizards. These were the first reptiles on Earth, or rather reptilomorphs. All reptilomorphs can be divided into four groups. The first group included all synapsids. The group consisted only of pelicosaurs which later split into several new groups. It were very advanced animals. The creatures already had normal nostrils and ears. The most characteristic representative of the first reptiles belonging to the synapsid group was the edaphosaurus. This animal resembled a huge lizard. On the back of Adaphosaurus there was a high crest of long bone spikes connected by a leathery membrane. Adaphosaurus was a herbivore and lived near coal marshes. Some of them reached 3.5 meters in length, and the mass reached 300 kilograms. Another group of synapsids were the Spenacodons. These were predators, the first among tetrapids to grow powerful fangs at the corners of their jaws. In the Carboniferous, only Macromerian was known from this family. Spinacodons are our distant ancestors. All mammals are descended from them. 
The size of the animals range from 60 centimeters to 3 meters. Other smaller representatives of synapsids were varanopids. And the most numerous of the synapsids was the Ophiacodon. The size of the animal could reach up to one and a half meters. Anthracosaurs, the most primitive reptilomorphs, possibly the ancestors of all other groups. These animals did not yet have eardrums in their ears. Some anthracosaurs had a weakly defined tail fin. Anthracosaurs ranged in size from 60 centimeters to 4.5 meters. Eugerinus was the largest anthracosaurus. The third large group of reptilomorphs, sauropsids. They were real little lizards. Helonymus was the distant ancestor of all turtles. And Petrolochosaurus is a distant ancestor of all other modern reptiles, as well as dinosaurs and birds. A separate representative of the reptilomorphs was the Soldonosaurus, which reached 60 centimeters in length. Secrets of the Paleozoic Era, Permian Period. 260 million years ago, the Carboniferous Period ended and the Permian Period began. The last period in the Paleozoic Era, the Earth looked something like this. Tectonic plates traveled across the planet unnoticed by the standards of human time, and it would not be surprising if in 200 million years, Earth would look something like this. Interesting fact. During this period, the formation of Pangaea, a supercontinent ended. The huge superocean Pantalessa, hoping about 70% of the planet's surface, brushed the shores of Pangaea. A second major ocean, the Paleotethys, washed into the shores of Pangaea from the east and was responsible for the relatively mild and humid climate of the coastal regions, creating shelters for moisture-loving land dwellers. The end of the Permian period accounts for the most devastating mass extinction in Earth history in 542 million years. The beginning of the Permian period was marked by glaciation on the southern continents and a corresponding drop in sea level across the planet. However, as Gondwana moved northward, the land warmed and the ice gradually melted. At the same time, parts of Eurasia became very hot and dry, and vast deserts spread there. During this period, vertebrates began to dominate. According to some data, up to 82% of all the animal genera living at the time. The marine fauna of the Permian was much poorer than that of the Carboniferous. Foraminifers were rare, the number of sponges, corals, and echinoderms decreased sharply. New forms of brachiopods that live in the Indian Ocean today are emerging. The bryozoans continue to exist. These creatures formed reefs. Astracod and worm-like crustaceans achieved significant development. Cartilaginous fishes were the most prosperous class of fishes in the Permian. They were sharks with spiral teeth. The cartilaginous fish, the ancient stingrays, also belonged to the cartilaginous ones. Freshwater sharks appeared. With the beginning of the Permian, amphibians became quite diverse. Small forms, few centimeters in size, live side by side with giant frog ancestors that reached the size of bullfrogs. While quadrupeds accounted for about half of all vertebrates in the Carboniferous, in the Permian the share of these animals increased to 69% of all genera. Since the beginning of the Permian, amphibians have become quite diverse. Adapting to terrestrial conditions, these creatures spent less and less time in the water. The most prosperous group were the dark spondyls, the Subordiscalia. These are rather thick and sedentary animals with a massive head and a short tail. Euskili ranged in length from 40 centimeters to 2 meters. 
Among Iscalia, Platyhistrix is particularly interesting. This creature grew a folded cell on its back for the Morigulation. This is a unique case among amphibians. In the Permian, there was an animal that greatly interested scientists. The Prionosexus. This freshwater creature, as an adult, was virtually indistinguishable from modern crocodiles. The Prionosexus was the largest animal of the Permian period. The predator could reach up to 9 meters in length. The other large group was the Lepospondylida. These were small creatures from 25 centimeters to 1 meter. Many of these animals had lost all or part of their limbs. This is Eryops. One of the most formidable predators of that era, the Eryops was over 2 meters long. Eryops hunted smaller amphibians and reptiles and possibly fish. The Diplocal and Diplosibis were very strange predators. They were flattened animals with huge boomerang-shaped heads and eyes pointing upward. Apparently, the creatures were hiding in a layer of silt at the bottom of bodies of water, waiting for prey to swim right over their heads. No one really knows why the heads of these predators were so strangely shaped. Perhaps it was their head that they used in a fight to strike their enemies from the side. Or maybe it was a kind of underwater wing that helped the animal to rise up while swimming. After a while, the climate became dry. The amphibians, with their moist, porous skin, had to take shelter in the few mostoses that remained among the deserts. Many of the animals became extinct. A new group of animals that were better adapted to the orid environment began to spread rapidly across the planet. These were the reptiles. The first reptiles were small and similar to lizards. The creatures fed mainly on arthropods and worms. But soon larger reptiles appeared, preying on smaller ones. Over time, both predators and their prey acquired large and powerful jaws to fight against numerous enemies. Over time, the reptiles grew larger and more ferocious. While amphibians, like their fish ancestors, produced by laying eggs in water, reptiles began to lay their eggs directly on land. The evolution of reptiles was very rapid, since there were no animals on land yet capable of competing with them. Long before the end of the Permian period, reptiles displaced stegocephals. Primitive reptiles called cotyledons gave birth to numerous descendants that later took over water, land and air. Measuring from a frog to a hippopotamus, the various creatures still had many labyrinthodontic traits. Teeth and ribs arranged from the neck to the tail, short massive limbs. But the structure of the skull, vertebrae, and skin were already the same as in reptiles. Another animal, Nike, was occupied by periosaurs. These herbivores were up to three meters in size. Periosaurs had bony bones in the shoulder girdle characteristic of fish and amphibians. The periosaurus skull was a continuous bone box with openings for the eyes, nostrils, and parietal organ. These animals lived on the banks of rivers and lakes. Cotyledons reached their heyday in the mid-Permian, when they became extinct at the beginning of the Trisic. But the descendants of these animals evolved vigorously. Permian reptiles adapted to a wide variety of environments. Most groups of animals became more mobile, and skeletons of creatures became lighter. These animals fed on a variety of foods. The diet consisted of plants, mollusks, and fish. Real predators are also appearing. Pelicazars. These animals had higher ridges on their spines. In some reptiles, limbs lengthened and skin bones disappeared. The teeth of herbivores became flat, and a four-meter-long predator like an astroncilia had real fangs. Among the predatory reptiles, 
forms resembling modern wolves, heinous, and mountains appear. This suggests that the lifestyles of animals of that time and those of today were similar. All Permian reptiles are divided into two classes. Savropsids, the ancestors of modern reptiles. The beast eaters, the ancestors of mammals. Of the genus Periosaurus, scientists have isolated the most popular representative called Scotosaurus. In Perm, the older Mesosaurs were separated from the terrestrial anapsids. They were the first reptiles that returned to the aquatic lifestyle. Permian Mesosaurs were small, reaching a size of up to one meter. Mesosaurs had needle-like teeth. These teeth acted as a sieve. The Mesosaur took a mouthful of small invertebrates or fish, clenched its jaws, squeezed water out through its teeth and swallowed whatever was left in its mouth. The second evolutionary branch of the Zevropsids. Diapsids. One of the species of Diapsida. One of the first evolutionary attempts to make a land lizard. These animals experienced a heyday in the Carboniferous and gradually became extinct in the Permian. Archosauromaths are the ancestors of crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. The animals are relatively large, up to two meters long. Some are beginning to look vaguely like dinosaurs. The first of the flying reptiles was Celerosaurus, whose remains have been found in Europe and Madagascar. Externally, the reptile resembled a modern flying lizard. The Celerosaurus reached 40 centimeters in length. The wingspan of its arms reached 30 centimeters. The reptile's light skeleton and skull reduced its total body weight. The creature had a crest on the back of its head, which improved its aerodynamic qualities. In the Permian period, there were the ancestors of lizards and snakes, the Lepidosauromaths. Primitive infracosaurs were a transitional link from amphibians to reptiles. In the Permian period, these animals were not yet extinct, although they gradually declined. Anthracosaurs were semi-aquatic and reached three meters in length, but most species were much smaller. The other large class of reptiles that lived in the Permian was the beast eaters. Animals that belonged to this species had incisors, fangs, and knobby molars. Beast-eared mammals also resembled mammals in the structure of the scapula and pelvis. All this evidence suggests that the beast-eared tooth-eaters were the ancestors of mammals. By the end of the Permian, a group of more agile beast-like reptiles emerged. They were gorgonauts. The early reptiles had legs on the sides of their bodies, like many modern lizards. For this reason, these reptiles moved only in a lurch. The bodies of these lizard-like animals bent from side to side as they walked. The Gorgonops reptiles, on the other hand, had legs growing under their bodies. This allowed the predators to take longer steps and therefore run faster. Many Gorgonops were armed with huge fangs capable of tearing through the thick skins of armored reptiles. The beast-like reptiles, or synapsids, were the most thriving group of reptiliomorphs of the Permian. These animals gradually evolved toward mammals. Synapsids grew fangs, fur and swake glands, and learned to maintain a constant body temperature. The most primitive of them all, pelicosaurs evolved into many different species and became the largest and most common reptiles of the era. Most pelicosaurs had large teeth, and it can be inferred that these predators hunted large game. Some species switched to plant food. Plants were much slower to digest. The stomachs of plant-eating pelicosaurs had to hold a lot of food and for a long time. So these animals must have increased in size. However, very soon the carnivorous reptiles became larger as well. The Caesars. Caesars was up to six meters in size, weighing up to two tons. Most of the families of Caesars were herbivores, but there was one insect-eating family. 
The largest terrestrial animals of the Permian were Caesars, but their large size didn't save these creatures from rapid extinction. In the second half of the Permian period, whole families of Caesars were wiped out by Gurgonauts. The family Varanopsida grew noticeably during the Permian, but no other changes occurred with these animals. At the beginning of the Permian period, the mammalian ancestors of Spanakodonts were experiencing the heyday of their evolution. They were the largest and most advanced predators of their time. The largest of these animals could reach four and a half meters in length. Another more advanced group, belonging to the synapsid class, were the therapsids. Therapsids had limbs that did not stick out to the sides like those of pelicosaurs and modern crocodiles, but were positioned almost vertically beneath the body. This allowed therapsids to run, though not very fast. But this class of animals did not yet know how to curve the spine to accelerate running. Therapsids had no scales or fur. Many had tactile hairs on their muzzles, much like the whiskers of cats. Predatory therapsids had well-defined fangs. The first crop that separated from the general line of therapsids belonged to the genus Biomosichus. They were predators from six meters in size. The largest of these species was Evanthosaurus, named after the traveler and paleontologist Ifremove. The next large suborder of therapsids was Dinocephalus. These animals were characterized by a very large skull with very thick bones. They were herbivorous, hippopod-like creatures up to five meters long and up to two tons in weight. The animals of this class did not eat grass, but nibbled on the lower branches of tree ferns or chewed on semi-decayed trunks. A new species called Titanozones of the Dinocephalus family was already less picky about food. Like boars, his creatures switched from a purely vegetarian diet to a more universal one. On occasion, titanozones consumed carrion and probably hunted small defenseless prey. Another not so thriving family of the suborder Dinocephalus was the Enthusers. These were large predators, like bears, up to six meters long with a tail, but relatively slender, no more than 600 kilograms. The next member of the therapsids was the suborder anomodonts. These were small creatures from 20 centimeters to a little over a meter, metas herbivorous and insectivorous. Some members of this suborder lived in burrows. Some anomodonts had two large fangs on their upper jaws, which were used for digging edible roots out of the ground. Another suborder of synapsids was the Veriodonts. These animals had a normal set of teeth like mammals, incisors, cannons, and molars. The most highly developed rope among the Veriodontids was the Gorgonauts. Gorgonauts were the first creatures capable of running fast for short distances. At the end of the Permian, Gorgonauts dominated all ecological niches of large terrestrial predators. Gorgonauts ranged in size from fur meters. Smaller Gorgonauts look similar to modern wild dogs because the ecological nature was the same. The largest of all Gorgonauts was considered to be Inostrancivia. Another suborder of Veriodonts, Veracephalus. Unlike Gorgonauts, the limbs of Teracephalus were widely spaced, which did not allow them to run fast. Some Theracephals, such as Sachambashir, had venomous teeth, like those of modern snakes. Other species of beast-like reptiles arose in the late Permian. Dysonodonts. Some of these species were no larger than a rat, while others were as big as a cat. Dysonodonts live mostly on land, but some shifted to aquatic life. Toward the end of the Permian, some groups of reptiles became warm-blooded. This means that they could stay active longer and didn't need to warm up in the morning after a cold night. The last and most advanced suborder of the Theriodonts was thought to be the Xenodonts. They were the direct ancestors of mammals. The skulls of Xenodonts had changed. Their jaws became stronger and more rigid, allowing them to chew larger prey. 
Scientists believe that canadents developed a furry coat to maintain their body temperature. These animals were very similar to mammals. It is even believed that the Platypus and Echin are in fact the same canadents that survive to this day. The end of the Permian period was marked by great cataclysmic events. The continents collided, new mountain ranges were rising, the sea was advancing on land, then retreating again. The climate changed frequently and dramatically. Millions of animals and plants were unable to adapt to all these changes and disappeared from the face of the earth. In this greatest extinction in the history of the plain, more than half of all animal families died. More than 90% of terrestrial animals and 70% of marine animals became completely extinct. Ancient corals also disappeared, to be replaced by modern reforming corals. And finally, the final extinction of the trilobiates. Secrets of the Mesozoic Era, Triassic Period. Before the Triassic, all continents existed as one giant supercontinent, Pangaea. With the onset of the Triassic, Pangaea began to gradually split into Gondwana and Eurasia. The Atlantic Ocean began to form. Warming climates caused many inland seas to dry up. The consequences of the Permian extinction had a strong negative impact on the fauna and flora of our planet. But during the first 10 million years, life gradually recovered and flourished. Changes in temperature across the Triassic began to have a noticeable effect on plants and animals. Certain groups of reptiles adapted to the cold seasons. From these groups, mammals and somewhat later, birds evolved in the Triassic. The temperature drop was strongest in the northern latitudes. The climate in the rest of the Uris remained warm. Therefore, the few reptiles that Soviv did well. Thanks to the hot climate, vegetation developed very fast. Marine invertebrates played a big role in creating a favorable climate. Reforming animals and ammonites. Reefs up to a thousand meters thick were beginning to form. This phenomenon favored the formation of an ecological system. Bivalves, algae, sea urchins, starfish, and sponges lived between corals and formed the cores, or fine sand that filled all coral voids. Some of the cephalopod mollusks that inhabited the seas reached gargantuan sizes. The shells of some of them were as much as 5 meters in diameter. Today, the seas are home to enormous cephalopods such as squids, which were up to 18 meters long. But in the Mesozoic era, there were many more giant forms. These are the nautiloids, the first cephalopod mollusks. Throughout the Paleozoic era, the nautiloids were the most common marine predators. Then new, more highly organized cephalopods appeared, including ammonites. Numerous ammonites all but disappeared during the Permian extinction. But by the mid-Triassic, the populations of these creatures had spread again across the land. New mollusks, such as oysters, appeared in the seas. Oysters burrowed into the bottom sand, running water through their shells and filtering out food particles from it. Many new gastropod mollusks also appeared. These are snails and their relatives. New varieties of coral, shrimp and lobster began to appear. The ancestors of sea lilies, the urchins and sea stars began to appear. The Triassic seas were inhabited by calcareous sponges, brazones, feeding crayfish and ostracus. Ancient sharks swam in fresh water, and the seas were teeming with molluscocus of all kinds. The first primitive bunny fish appeared. Sharks and bunny fish were constantly creating conflicts over prey. 
Each species tried to dominate the other. Over time, fish and sharks developed jaws capable of ripping apart the shells of crabs and shells of mollusks like mussels. The diversity of rayfishes increased. Predators like the mud and pike appeared among the rays. The largest trisic rays reached one meter in length. For example, lizard fish consumed terrazers among other foods. Fossilized remains of flying animals were found in the stomachs of these fish. Cartilaginous fish, on the other hand, nearly extinct in the Triassic period. This class was now threatened with extinction. The primate Jolas conodonts of the Cambrian period became extinct in the Triassic. The insects of the Titanoptera appeared. These were gigantic reshoppers up to 36 centimeters long. The largest predators of the Trisic seas were aquatic reptiles. Noticers looked like lizards, they used their sharp teeth to catch fish. The familiar ichthyosaurs could outrun any prey, thanks to their prodigious speed. Large newt-like placodents crawled about on the seafloor, searching for shells, and then crushing their prey with their powerful, flat teeth. The most famous Proterosaurus, Tenostrophus. Tenostrophus had a long and thin neck that was twice as long as its tarsa. It was a terrestrial animal and probably used its graceful neck as a fishing rod. Standing at the water's edge, Tenostrophus was able to reach fish swimming underwater quite a distance from the shore. At the beginning of the Triassic period, the animal life was the same throughout the Earth's landmass. Different species could spread unhindered throughout the Pangea because there were no large water barriers in the way. Huge herds of herbivorous Lystrosas made short journeys and rested near lakes and rivers. Scientists have found fossil remains of these animals in various countries. These include China, India, South Africa, and even Antarctica. In the early Triassic, the first frogs foraged alongside them. Later, the ancestors of frogs were joined by the first terrestrial and aquatic turtles, as well as crocodiles. Very soon, aquatic turtles and crocodiles invaded the warm seas. There, these creatures quickly multiplied and sprayed throughout the world's oceans. In the Triassic period, vertebrates became the dominant class, and from this class, the quadrupeds were strongly distinguished. This is when a new group called Reptilomorphs was born. Reptilomorphs did not lay eggs, but laid them. From Reptilomorphs, a group of Archosauromorphs proliferated. And from that group came the most numerous subgroup called the Archosaurs. Archosaurs means ruling reptiles. The first archosaurs were small animals that hunted small game along the banks of lakes and rivers. Subsequently, large members of the fauna began to evolve from small animals. The largest group of Triassic archosaurs was called the Crorotus. Unlike the first denosaurs, these were stocky, powerful and relatively clumsy creatures. And this is a family belonging to the class Archosaurs in the order the Cardans. Scientists gave these creatures the name Phytosaurus. Phytosaurs were semi-aquatic, almost like modern crocodiles. The family Pseudopalatinus stands out here and includes the largest almost terrestrial animals of the Triassic age, up to 12 meters long. The third large order of the Crorotas is the Etosaurs. These animals were herbivores and had bony plates on their skin, and some acquired horns. Atosaurus was typically three to five meters long. Also in the Triassic period, the group of Prosauropods appeared. These were the direct ancestors of all the dinosaurs. Unlike true sauropods, the prosauropods retained the ability to stand on their hind legs and eat the leaves from the top of a particularly tall tree. The largest family of Triassic prosauropods was Platosaurida. 
which reached 7 to 10 meters in length and weighed almost a ton. The next large family of tricep prosauropods was the Rhesiosaurida, which reached approximately the same size as the Plathosaurida. But the order of true sauropods in the tricep was just beginning to form. Another large group of tricic animals. These are the theropods. This is the only troop of predatory dinosaurs. All other dinosaurs were herbivores. Another family of theropods arose during the tricic period. This family was the Herinoceros, which reached a length of 2 to 6 meters and a weight of 30 to 350 kilograms. The Triassic period also saw the emergence of two genera of avian dinosaurs. Small and nimble plant-eating creatures reached up to one meter in length and 10 kilograms in weight. At the end of the Triassic period, two important events occurred in the evolution of life on Earth. One event occurred on land and marked the emergence of the first mammals. The second event occurred in the air and was related to the coming of the Pterosaurs. Eschaltosaurus. This was a small lizard that lived in the Permian period that attempted to take to the air. Eschaltosaurus had no real wings, but this creature glided from tree to tree like mud and flying squirrels. Perosaurs were a special branch of archosaurs that separated in the tricep from the general line. These small archosaurs acquired leathery wings and learned to flee. The first perosaurs fed on insects. A special representative of the tricep archosaurs is Protervis, the ancestor of all birds. However, not all paleontologists agree that Protervis is the ancestor of all birds. Another group of reptilian archosaurs, plant-eating rhynchosaurs. The jaws and teeth of rhynchosaurs were perfectly adapted to cut and chop hard plants. Euparcharida appeared, which were similar to small dinosaurs, but were not related. They were very nimble creatures. Euparcharida were able to run across water bodies on the surface, like today's vasilisks lizards. Lapidosauromaths are the creatures from which modern snakes and lizards evolved. Among the ancestors of reptiles, a particularly large group stood out, Xyvropterygia. They were creatures that transitioned to an aquatic lifestyle, like today's seals. Of the Xyvropterygia, the most popular is called Notosaurus. Placodents tried to occupy the ecological niche of sea turtles, but these representatives of the Lepidosauromorphs had nothing to do with turtles. Placodents reached between 90 centimeters and 2 meters in length. Not all placodents had a well-developed carapace. Some had only isolated bony plates, almost invisible. The Triassic period was marked by the appearance of plesiosaurs. But so far, these inhabitants were small, no more than two meters. Pistosaurus was one of the most prominent of all. Pistosaurus was about three meters long and weighed up to 450 kilograms. Pistosaurus had a very long neck, a very stiff backbone. Its limbs were represented by fins shaped like oars. Pistosaurus fed exclusively on fish, possessing teeth ideal for catching. In the Triassic period, the first beaked headed lizards, close to modern Gatria, appeared. Various species of ichthyosaurs flourished in the water. These quadrups, like modern dolphins and whales, finally transitioned to a fully aquatic lifestyle. Ichthyosaurs eventually became hydrodynamic and viviparous. The huge round eyes of ichthyosaurs are due to the fact that these animals did not choose echolocating like whales or dolphins. Ichthyosaurs relied entirely on their vision and it can be said that the eyes of predators made a huge evolution and transformation. 
the poles of early ichthyosaurs evolved into fins. This was a huge advantage in finding prey in the vast ocean. Ichthyosaurs began to grow in size and split into numerous species. Chastosaurus is considered the largest of the ichthyosaur family. The largest Chastosaurus reached a length of 23 meters and weighed up to 40 tons. Chastosaurus was the record holder for size among the Trisic and previous periods. In the Trisic, the first true turtles appeared. The tortoise shell was not yet formed, and these reptiles could not hide their head and poles in case of danger. The Triassic period was filled with a wide variety of lizards. At the very beginning of the Mesozoic, the large-scale extinction was still going on. It hit the synapsid growth of Reptilomorphs hard. The largest crop of canons or dogtooths remained at the top of the food chain. Canadonts were fast-footed, predatory reptiles that attacked herds of slow herbivorous animals. In the late Triassic, Cynodonts gave rise to true mammals, like the ancestors of today's mice and shrews. Aside from these synapsids, there were also small pterocephals, which survived the Permian Triassic extinction. The smallest growth of animals in the Triassic can be attributed to all amphibians. Capitosaurs belonged to this group. These were large crocodile-like creatures from two to six meters in length. Among the amphibians, small creatures such as Trimatosaurus and Plagiosaurus are known from the Triassic. Among new species, Metoposaurus and Chigothosaurus also appeared, reaching up to three meters in length. In the Triassic, the first frog, Triadelbatrachus, appeared. Unlike modern frogs, this tenth long animal had a small tail that looked more like a spur. About 225 million years ago, a group of reptiles called the Tecodonts Aros. Tecodonts were aquatic and swam with their powerful tails, suiting with their hind legs, which were much larger than the front legs. When early Tecodonts emerged from the water onto dry land, their strong hind legs quickly adapted to walking on solid ground. A little later, Tecodonts began not only to walk quickly, but also to run quickly. These animals used four legs to walk, but they could run using only their hind legs. Over the next 20 million years, the Codonts evolved into the first dinosaurs on Earth. These were sedentary animals with a small torso, small limbs, and a large head. Stegocephalus used an ambush when hunting. Predators waited for prey to pass by and suddenly attacked their prey. Mastodonosaurs. The skulls of these animals were up to one meter long. Mastodonosaurus resembled giant frogs in appearance. These giant frogs hunted fish and therefore rarely left the aquatic environment. The swamps were getting smaller, and the Mastodonosaurus had to inhabit deeper and deeper places, often accumulating in large numbers. This is why many skeletons of these animals are now found in small areas. In the Triassic, very many groups of the most diverse animals appear. But by the end of the period, all of the animal species listed above are extinct. The empty niches of extinct animals are filled by new creatures. Dinosaurs and other reptiles became the dominant group of land animals. Among the dinosaurs, the theropods and prosauropods appeared. Theropods moved on well-developed hind limbs, had a heavy tail, powerful jaws, small and weak for limbs. These animals ranged in size from a few centimeters to 15 meters. Theropods were absolute predators. Prosauropods fed, as a rule, on plants. Some of them were omnivorous animals. The herbivores walked on four legs. Prosauropods had a small head, long neck and tail. Plesiosaurs lived in the sea but sometimes ventured ashore. Predators reached 15 meters in length and fed on fish. There's something else worth mentioning. 
It's Cheritrium, or Cheritrium. It's not a living creature. That's what scientists call a fossil trisic footprint. Coincidentally, these footprints look remarkably similar to the hands of monkeys, humans, and bears. Cheritrian footprints were first discovered in German Triassic sandstones in 1834 and then in England in 1838. The same traces were found before dinosaurs were known. Theories as to what animal these footprints belonged to are quite varied. But no one has yet come to a consensus. Many reptiles appeared in the sea which undoubtedly evolved from the mainland ancestors. Turtles with a broad bone shell, dolphin-like ichthyosaurs and giant plesiosaurs with a small head on a long neck rapidly evolve. Ichthyosaurus had a row of uniform teeth. In turtles, the fave-toed limbs of ichthyosaurs evolve into well-adapted flippers for swimming. Beginning in the Triassic period, reptiles that moved to live in the sea gradually settled in more and more expanses of the ocean. Secrets of the Mesozoic Era, Jurassic Period 199 million years ago, the Triassic period ends. The Jurassic period begins. The active collapse of the supercontinent Pangaea continues. After the mass extinction, nature began to gradually recover. After the giant continent split, animals could no longer move freely across the planet. Abundant rain began to soak up the moisture of the ancient Triassic deserts, and the world became greener again, with more lush vegetation. As Pangaea began to split, new seas and straits emerged, harboring new types of animals and algae. sponges and bryozoans, sea stars and sea lilies. The five-armed sea lilies became common in the Jurassic. Giant coral reefs formed, harboring numerous ammonites. The ancestors of octopuses and squids, the belemnites, appeared. The Jurassic seas were home to many different species of fish. These included rays and sharks, as well as bony, cartilaginous, and ganoids. Radiant fish occupied a dominant niche in the Jurassic period. The largest raven fish of that time was Lidsichthys. The creature reached 16 meters in length and fed on plankton, like modern whales and whale sharks. In the Jurassic, the first herring fish appeared. Cartilaginous fishes continue in decline, apparently because ichthyosaurs and zooropterygii successfully compete with sharks. During this period, one of the oldest shark-like fish, the Helicoprion, which had been known since the Carboniferous period, dies out. In the Jurassic period, there were fewer ammonites than in the Triassic. Belemnites were close relatives of modern cuttlefish and squid. These sea creatures had a cigar-shaped inner skeleton. Belemnites, like modern octopuses and squids, produced an inky fluid and used it to create a smokescreen when trying to escape predators. In the Jurassic Seas, bivalves, especially those belonging to the oyster family, also developed significantly. Among the Jurassic gastropod mollusks, there are two genera that have survived unchanged to the present day. These are the pondworms and the coelacanth. Sea urchins gradually evolved from an oblong shape to a round shape. On land, in lakes and rivers, there were many different species of crocodiles, widely dispersed over the globe. There were also saltwater crocodiles with long snouts and sharp teeth for catching fish. Some varieties of crocodiles even grew flippers instead of legs to make it easier to swim. Tail fins allowed crocodiles to develop greater speed in the water than on land. New genera of fossil turtles appeared and modern turtles appeared at the end of the Jurassic period. 
A huge number of species of plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs appeared, in serious competition with the new, fast-moving sharks and extremely agile bony fish. Freshwater bodies were home to a large number of amphibians. These are almost modern salamanders, frogs, and worms. Many crustaceans appeared. These are the bipeds, ten-legged, leaf-eating crayfish, and freshwater sponges. The first ichthyosaurs are known to have appeared as early as the Triassic period. In the Jurassic, these reptiles adapted perfectly to life. Although ichthyosaurs were thought to be reptiles, the fossil record suggests that they were viviparous, producing offspring as mammals do. It is possible that the offspring of ichthyosaurs were born on the open sea, like whales. Plesiosaurs were also a large group of predators that lived in the Jurassic seas. Plesiosaurs had a thick torso with four leaf-shaped limbs, a long serpentine neck with a small head. The marine predators hunted for schools of small fish with their flexible necks. Another group of short-necked predatory reptiles. These are the pliosaurs. Pliosaurs spent their lives in great depths. Some large pliosaurs also preyed on smaller plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. The Jurassic seas were relatively shallow. Therefore, the remains of animals that were carried by sea currents or waves were well preserved in such places. The great vegetation of the Jurassic period contributed to the widespread distribution of reptiles. The very first dinosaurs appeared over 200 million years ago. Over the course of 140 million years, these popular creatures evolved into many different species. Dinosaurs spread to all continents and adapted to live in a wide variety of habitats. Some dinosaurs were no larger than a squirrel. Others weighed more than 15 adult elephants combined. Some were heavy on four legs. Others ran faster on two legs than Olympic sprint champions. Dinosaurs gave rise to the science of paleontology. So, most of the dinosaurs of the Jurassic period belonged to the order Zorischia. But there was also the genus Avianetosaurus dinosaurs, or the order Ornithischia. The suborders were divided into suborders, among which the most famous ones stood out. Sauropodomorphs. The suborders were divided into infraspecies. The most popular infraorder is the sauropods. Sauropods moved on four legs and had five toes on each foot. Their main food was plant food. Sauropods had a long neck, a small head, and a long tail. At the moment, there is a serious debate among experts in paleontology as to whether dinosaurs could have had two brains. Some argue that such creatures as Stegosaurus had a second brain. Others vehemently refute this theory. These long-necked beasts roamed the Jurassic savannas and ate up all the vegetation they could reach. After a herd of sauropods had passed, the dense forest turned into a lifeless wasteland. Some species of sauropods lived in herds, with the adults taking care of children and juveniles. For other sauropod species, children were raised separately from their parents and the herd was joined by older individuals. In the Jurassic Park movie series, sauropods are shown chewing on leaves and branches. In fact, sauropods bit off and immediately swallowed vegetation. The food went into their stomachs and was grinded there already with the help of rocks, which the animals swallowed in advance. The most numerous family of Jurassic sauropods. Diplodocs and numerous varieties. The largest sauropod is considered to be Amphicelius. The weight of this animal reached up to 150 tons and its length was up to 50 meters. Most individuals in the family of Diplodocus did not exceed 25 meters and weighed no more than 40 tons. The family of Diplodocus included such animals as Superzorus, Apodosaurus, and of course Diplodocus himself. Diplodocus appeared before many sauropods and is the oldest dinosaur. 
this herbivore reached up to 28 meters in length. A supersaurus of the same family spent most of its life grazing in swamps and lakes, where it was safe from predators. Apatosaurus or Brontosaurus was quite tall, had a large hump on its back and a very thick tail. Like all Diplodox Apatosaurus preferred to live in swampy areas. From the Diplodocus family came another family called the Dicreosaurs. These were small animals compared to the Diplodocus. No more than 10 meters long and weighing no more than 4 tons. This is the family Macronarius. The most diverse family after the Diplodocus. These sauropods didn't differ much from the Diplodocus sauropods. These animals made louder noises than Diplodocuses because of the large leathery sacs under their noses. The most popular species among the Macronarians were Brachiosaurs. Brachiosaurs could reach leaves from taller trees. Diplodocuses could not do this. Although all Macronarians were small, Brachiosaurus was a true giant. The average animal was up to 27 meters long and weighed up to 50 tons. Brachiosaurus needed a daily diet of 500 kilograms of green matter. The smallest Jurassic sauropods were considered Anchisaurus. Up to 4 meters long and only up to 30 kilograms in weight. Which sauropod had the longest neck? Mammonsosaurus. With a total body length of 25 meters, the herbivore had a neck length of 15 meters. There were also primitive sauropods in the Jurassic period. These were the Volcanodonts, the ancestors of the Diplodocus and Macronarius. The bones of these dinosaurs were not hollow, as in advanced sauropods, but almost solid. Their necks were short. And the body was not adapted for total vegetation eating. Volcanodonts could eat grass and eat trees, but in much smaller quantities than the descendants. These could weigh up to 48 tons and be up to 18 meters long. Another ancestor of sauropods that lived in the early Jurassic period, Shunosaurus. This animal differed from the other prosauropods in that it had a mace on its tail. This weapon was used by Shunosaurus to defend itself against enemies. In the middle of the Jurassic period, the prosauropods could not compete with evolution and died out quietly. And of course, in the Jurassic period, the suborder theropods flourished. Theropods represented all the predatory dinosaurs on our planet. Predators moved on two hind legs, which were almost indistinguishable from those of birds. Many theropods incubated their eggs like birds. Some theropods had feathers. For a long time, birds were thought to have evolved from theropods. Now, most paleontologists agree that birds were separated from the main lineage of archosaurs in the Triassic and that the resemblance of theropods to birds is simply a parallel evolutionary joke. The forelimbs of theropods look similar to those of humans, but the bone and muscle structure of theropods was quite different, and their arms were much less mobile than ours. Theropods could not rotate the hand, turning it up or down with the palm of their hand. And some carnivores had fingers that didn't bend at all. So, which theropods lived in the Jurassic? A group called the Coelophysoids. These nimble carnivores were up to 1. 5 meters long and weighed up to 300 kilograms. Smaller cephasoids were not true carnivores, but ate insects and carrion. Larger species preyed on sauropods and prosauropods when these animals were small. The largest coelophysoid was thought to be Dilophosaurus. There is much debate among paleontologists about what Dilophosaurus looked like. Did this animal have a hood and did it spit venom? The big question. Another lineage of theropods was represented by ceratosaurs. Scientists very often enlisted new and unknown species of dinosaurs to the ceratosaurus and therefore this suborder became very numerous. It included animals from 1 meter to 12 meters in length. And the weight could range from a few kilograms to one ton. Some of the ceratosaurs moved on to a plant-eating lifestyle. Then theropods were divided into perfect and imperfect predators. The perfect carnivores came to be called thetanuri. 
The most ancient representatives of Fetners were Cryolophosaurus and Pivodosaurus. Cryolophosaurus is interesting because it lived in Antarctica and calmly endured winter frosts. The next family of Jurassic theropods was the Megalosauridae or giant lizards. Megalosaurids are large predators up to 12 meters long and up to 5 tons in weight. These beasts preyed on young individuals of large sauropods and also ate the bodies of older individuals who had died their own deaths. The largest predator of this family was Torvosaurus. Torvosaurus had huge, sharp teeth like the teeth of a saw. The predator used these teeth to tear the flesh of its victims. Megalosaurids populated all areas of the globe. Paleontologists have found remains in North America, Europe, and Africa. At the very beginning of their evolution, individuals of this family were fragile and small. But the later megalosaurids were real giant monsters. Muscular forelimbs aided in the hunting of large herbivorous dinosaurs. Their sharp claws undoubtedly left terrible lacerations in the side of their prey. The powerful neck of the predator allowed it to plunge its dagger-like fangs deep into the body of its prey with terrible force and tear out huge chunks of still warm meat. Another infraspecies of theropods that deserves attention. These are the carnosaurs. Jurassic carnosaurs were up to 12 meters in size and weighed up to 5 tons. The most famous of the carnosaurs was Allosaurus. Despite its large size, Allosaurus was very agile. On a short distance predators developed speed up to 55 km per hour, and strong and dexterous arms of Allosaurus allowed to grasp small vertebrate prey confidently. Many paleontologists believe that Allosaurus gathered in packs and attacked herds of sauropods, selecting relatively small individuals. There is also a theory that adult Allosaurus took care of their offspring, in particular, they gave some of the meat they caught to children. By the way, Allosaurus was not the biggest Carnosaurus. The largest Carnosaur was Epinterias. This theropod reached about 12 meters in length, which made this animal larger than an Allosaurus. Epinterias, like Allosaurus, could probably use its jaw as an axe, striking its prey. All other theropods are related to the Zellurosaurus. Many of the raptors had feathers similar to those of modern birds. For a long time, birds were thought to be the descendants of the Velociraptors. Proceratosaurus is considered to be the common ancestor of all the Cellurosaurus species. The suborder Cellurosaurus consists of three infrorders. These are the four-meter-long dinosaurs Cellurity. The second infrorder is the Compsognathidae. Small theropods weighing up to three kilograms. The diet of these small carnivores consisted of rodents and insects. And the third infrorder consisted of Tyrannosaurids. Jurassic Tyrannosaurids were the ancestors of the famous Tyrannosaurus. The raptors were no more than 4 meters long and had primitive downy plumage. All further theropods bear the common name of Maniraptor. They were originally thought to be the direct ancestors of birds. But it turned out that Maniraptors had nothing to do with birds. This is what one of the suborder Maniraptor looks like. Epidexipteryx. These creatures were at first no more than 2 meters in length and then began to shrink. These small carnivores were mostly arboreal. The famous Stegosaurus. A small armored herbivorous dinosaur. This animal belonged to the suborder Thyreophores. Stegosaurus ranged in size from 4 to 12 meters. Weights ranged from 150 kilograms to 4.5 tons. Huge ridges on their backs and dangerous spikes on their tails were necessary weapons against predators. Stegosaurus grazed in herds, the, the adults taking care of the children. There was also a second infraspecies in the suborder Tyrarophores. These are the ankylosaurs. These animals relied on a more powerful passive defense. Ankylosaurs' bodies were covered with bony plates. Ankylosaurs were just forming in the Jurassic period. Jurassic herbivore shells were not yet very strong. Jurassic ankylosaurs were up to 4 meters long and weighed 1 ton. And this is a suborder of the bird-eating dinosaurs. 
Seropods. The main infrared seropods were the ornithopods. These plant-eating dinosaurs lived in forests and did not defend themselves from predators but ran away from them. Jurassic ornithopods were up to 8 meters long and weighed up to 700 kilograms. At the end of the Jurassic period, the ornithopods were separated from the marginocephalus, which began to grow horns on their heads. In the suborder of avian dinosaurs, the family of heterodontosaurs stands apart. These were the only dinosaurs which had incisors, canines and molar teeth, almost like those of mammals. Heterodontosaurs occupied the ecological niche of modern pigs in the Jurassic period. The animals dug roots out of the ground with their front limbs, chewed cones and nuts with their advanced teeth, did not disdain insects, and on occasion caught and ate small animals. Also, in the Jurassic period, there were separate species of avian dinosaurs, which did not fit into any of the large groups. Many small predators with beak-like jaws appeared. These are the scaly lepidosaurs. Today modern Africa is inhabited by herd animals such as gazelles, buffalo, and zebras. Huge herds of many thousands migrate from one part of Africa to another. In the Jurassic period, something similar was born. Thousands of gadrosaurs huddled in herds, traveling across the ancient lands of our planet. Gadrosaurs nibbled on stunted vegetation with their horny beaks, then chewed it up with their strong molars. After the Triassic-Jurassic extinction, the only supergroup of Kruritars survived. These were the Crocodilomorphs. At the very beginning of the Jurassic period, Sphenozoans dominated. These animals reached only up to one and a half meters in length. Other crocodilomorphs were even smaller, protozoa. It was up to one meter long and weighed no more than 40 kilograms. Over time, the group evolved and divided into several new groups. The more advanced group was Talatazucus. These were saltwater crocodiles that had their paws turned into fins. Talatazucids are divided roughly in half into two families. They are the Metrorhynchidae and the Teleosaurus. Metrorhynchids reached a length of 6 meters and lived in the open sea. These marine predators developed a tail fin and learned to drink seawater. Like sea turtles, Metrorhynchids only came ashore to lay their eggs. Teleosaurs could grow up to 9 meters and lived off the coast. In appearance and behavior, these creatures were virtually indistinguishable from contemporary crocodiles. The ancestors of modern crocodiles belonged to the Neozucus group. They were goniophilididae, which could reach up to 4 meters in length and looked almost like modern crocodiles. And the small rat-like land-dwelling Adiposauridae. Insect evolution accelerated dramatically in the Jurassic. Ancient nature was filled with the endless buzzing and crackling of many new species of insects, crawling and flying everywhere. Among them were the ancestors of today's ants, bees, earwigs, flies, and wasps. Many different dragonflies, beetles, cicadas, bedbugs, and spiders appeared. Later, in the Cretaceous period, there was a new evolutionary explosion when insects began to make contacts with the newly emerging flowering plants. In the Jurassic, thousands of pterosaurs took to the air. These were the first and largest flying vertebrates of the archosaurs. The evolution of these animals took off in the Jurassic period. The most famous pterosaurs of the early Mesozoic were Pterodactyl and Rampharynchus. Rampharynchus had long tails, long narrow wings, and a large skull with numerous teeth. Rampharynchus could take off from the ground. The masters of the sky settled on the banks of rivers, lakes, and seas. The wingspan of the Rampharynchus could reach two and a half meters. The nestlings of Rampharynchus could fly and feed on their own right after hatching from the egg. Among the Rampharynchidae, the family Aneuronathidae stood out. They were small insect-eating Rampharynchus the size of a sparrow. In the mid-Jurassic period, the pterodactyls evolved from the aneurognidids. These pterosaurs had more efficient wings and did not need a tail to maneuver in the air. 
Pterodactyls were no different in size and lifestyle from the Rampharynchids. Many pterodactyls had a long ossified ridge on their heads for improved aerodynamics. Flying creatures fed on fish, sometimes sea lilies, mollusks, and insects. Pterodactyls had to jump off cliffs or trees to take off. The first birds also appeared in the Jurassic. The ancestors of the first birds were the ancient reptile Pseudozuchii, which lived in the Triassic period and which also gave rise to dinosaurs and crocodiles. Three genera of Jurassic bird-like creatures are known. Archaeopteryx is more of a maniraptor than a bird. And Longipteryx is almost certainly a bird. Something like the modern kingfisher. But birds were still very rare in the Jurassic period. Another genus of animals that began to flourish in the Jurassic period. Lepidosauromorphs. The ancestors of lizards and snakes. Most of the Jurassic Lepidosauromorphs belong to the Zavropterygidae. They are marine reptiles with a lifestyle similar to that of today's seals. The largest suborder of Jurassic Zavropterygii is Pliosaurs. They are large and very large predators with short necks, elongated heads and large jaws. Pliosaurs could reach a length of up to 20 meters. Pliosaurs had an interesting feature. It was a special design of the nostrils, which served not for breathing, but solely for sniffing water. Plesiosaurs differed from pliosaurs in having a small head on a long neck. Plesiosaurs were also predators, but they ate smaller prey. Jurassic plesiosaurs ranged in length from 5 to 8 meters. There were few lizards in the Jurassic. More than half were beaked-headed lizards, a type of modern-day Gateria. Some of the lizards lived in freshwater reservoirs. The Jurassic synapsids consisted of primitive animals. Similar to modern platypuses and echidnas. The only known exception is the recently discovered beaver tail otter. This animal reached a length of 42 centimeters. Also interesting is the Frutifosser, the first anteater the size of a chipmunk in the history of the Earth. Among mammals, carnivores appeared. Some of these animals adapted to life in trees. Around this time, some 160 million years ago, the first placental mammals also appeared, like Juramea sinensis, the progenitor of all placental mammals. Secrets of the Mesozoic Era Cretaceous Period The Mesozoic Era has come to an end. The last and most saturated with prehistoric inhabitants of the Cretaceous Period. During the Cretaceous, the Great Rift of the Continents continued on our planet. The climate was no longer as hot and suitable for Jurassic animals. The northern territories of our planet had real winters with snow. But still, the temperatures of the Cretaceous were higher than today. In the Cretaceous period, life reached perhaps its greatest diversity. There had never been such great diversity of life on Earth. Never before or since. Throughout this remarkable period, there were no major catastrophes. Evolution proceeded slowly and quietly. Flowering plants appeared, which eased the erosion of the soil. This event resulted in fewer minerals entering the ocean. All of this led to a decrease in the variety of biomass. The depths of the ocean became less rich and fabulous than before. But because of the flowering plants, the mass of terrestrial vegetation increased greatly. The growth of flowering plants contributed to an increase in the number of nectar-eating and pollen-carrying insects, as well as fruit-eating and seed-dispersing animals. Insects that cannot live without flowering plants at all have appeared. These are butterflies and bees. Birds and mammals ate fruit and spread seeds over great distances, spreading plants to new areas of continents. Small animal populations grew. Flowery vegetation formed large dense thickets which sheltered small rodents, lizards, and snakes. 
During the Cretaceous, there were many groups of bivalve mollusks like mussels and gastropod mollusks like snails. The ammonites were fewer in number. Belemnites took the place of these creatures. New inhabitants appeared. Small shrimps, crabs, and lobsters. The first nummulites appeared. It was a type of coral that formed reefs. Giant mollusks spread very quickly in the oceans of the Cretaceous period. These are Inoceramus, which reached 1 meter in diameter, and Platoceramus, which could reach up to 3 meters in diameter. In their appearance, the gastropods and bivalves barely differed from the modern ones. Squid, octopus and nautiloids were not numerous in the Cretaceous seas. The most prosperous class of fish in the Cretaceous was, as now, the rayfish. The largest of the rayfin fishes were Protosphyrina reaching up to 3 meters in length, and Zithactina up to 6 meters. In the Cretaceous period, the first Kerosenids, Salmonids, and Pike appeared. The modern pike emerged just then and did not change a bit since then. Cretaceous sharks gradually began to look like modern sharks and reached a length of 7 meters, while rays reached 1 meter. Some species of Jurassic plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs were still found in the seas. Descendants of ichthyosaurs that became extinct at the beginning of the Cretaceous reached 20 m in length and had two pairs of short flippers. Cretaceous sea plesiosaurs, like Elasmosaurus, as well as giant mosasaurs, were regarded as masters of the seas. The prey of these predators consisted of all the fish species that inhabited the ocean. The giants were not very picky about food. In those days, giant Archelon sea turtles swam in the world's oceans, leisurely raking the warm water with their flippers in search of food. The Archelons were almost 4 meters long. The largest known specimen of Archelona found by scientists was 480 centimeters long, and the distance between the flippers reached 530 centimeters. This turtle weighed up to 4 tons in its lifetime. In the meantime, many interesting things were also happening on land. From lizard-like ancestors evolved true snakes. Large lizards with long spines on their backs inhabited the territory of modern Europe. Huge pythons crawled in the jungles of small chalk forests. Some new species of seabirds also appeared. Hesperornis were like great loons. Bees flew everywhere, moths and other insects flitted about. Numerous spiders were hiding among the foliage, scurrying for their prey. The new groups of plants quickly formed huge forests. For terrestrial animals, it became a true paradise. A variety of leaves and other edible vegetation gave rise to new animals. Forests were filled with more and more inhabitants. Dinosaurs were still the dominant animal group during the Cretaceous period. 49% of all Cretaceous animal genera Dinosaurs continued to evolve rapidly. New species emerged throughout the Cretaceous period, reaching their peak. One of the largest groups of dinosaurs was the lizard-eating dinosaurs. Most theropods are predatory bipedal dinosaurs. Theropods are becoming more diverse. This is because there are more and more diverse insects and mammals. The most primitive of all the theropods that survived into the Cretaceous period were the ceratosaurs. Distinguishing features of ceratosaurus from other theropods are bone plaques on the skin, like crocodiles, and horny ridges on the snout, protecting the eyes and nostrils from the desperate blows of unfortunate prey the ceratosaurs include two large families. The first family is the Abelisauridae. These were large predators up to 9 meters long and weighing up to 1 and a half tons. After Gondwana split apart, there were many islands that slowly traveled across the ocean to form the future continents. 
Africa, Australia, Eurasia, South America, and North America. Abelazorids lived only in the southern hemisphere. Their main prey were young sauropods and small mammals. Also, any of the predators safely fed on carrion. The arms of most abelazorids were very short and had four fingers. Among the Abelazoridae, the subfamily Carnotaurus stands out. This subfamily includes seven genera that descended from one ancestor. An interesting representative of the Abelazoridae is called Majungasaurus. This unusual predator had a horn on its forehead and bulldog jaws, unusual for dinosaurs, which are convenient for strangling large and strong prey. These dinosaurs had a fierce temper, fought a lot among themselves and enjoyed eating their defeated opponents. This is the only dinosaur species for which regular cannibalism has been reliably proven. Carnotaurus also had a shortened snout, but its jaws were weak. But its mouth was wide open and allowed to swallow very large pieces of food without chewing. In addition, Carnotaurus had full binocular vision. Another predator, Rhygosaurus. Rhygosaurus was almost no different from Majungasaurus, except that it weighed up to 4 tons. This is much more than the weight of any other Abelisaurus. The second family of Cretaceous Ceratosaurus is the Nosaurs. These animals were similar to Ceratosaurus, but were much smaller than Abelisauridae. Only up to 2.5 meters long and weighing up to 50 kilograms. The exception to this family was Delta Dromius. The Delta Dromius stood out from the Nosaurid family due to its gigantic size, reaching up to 13 meters in length and weighing up to 3.5 tons. The paws and muscles of Delta Dromius were incredibly strong. There is a theory that Delta Dromius grabbed and killed large prey not with its teeth, as most theropods do, but with its front paws. Now we will look at the descendants of the Jurassic Megalosaurus. This is the superfamily Megalosauroids or Spinosauroids. The fact is that the Megalosaurid family became extinct at the very beginning of the Cretaceous period. The last representative of this family was a Fravenator. The predator reached up to 9 meters in length. At the end of the Jurassic a new family had separated from the Megalosauridae. Spinosauridae. Like modern polar bears, these animals fed mainly on fish. But any member of this family could, on occasion, gobble up a small dinosaur if it got lost. And if the predator fisherman did not eat for a long time, he could even catch a fairly large animal. The jaws of spinosaurids were long, thin and weak, like those of dolphins or gavials. The teeth of the predators were numerous but small. Many spinosaurids grew a leathery sail on their backs, filled with blood vessels. The sail was used as a radiator in a car. If the sail was blown by the wind, it cooled the blood that flowed through the blood vessels inside. The sail was especially useful if the animal had to sit for a long time on the bank of the reservoir under the hot sun and the cold wind. If the predator overheated, the blood vessels in the sail expanded. If the animal froze, the blood vessels in the sail began to contract. Spinosaurids were very large animals. The body length together with the tail varied up to 18 meters and could weigh up to 9 tons. This family includes the largest terrestrial predators of all time. Now let's talk about the descendants of the Allosaurs. Carnosaurs. Carnosaurs had a good sense of smell, but were not very intelligent. The brains of predators were about the same as those of crocodiles. Cretaceous Carnosaurs are divided into two families. The first family is called the Carcharodontosauridae. These are very large animals that reached up to 13 and a half meters in length and weighed up to 6 tons. Among the Carcharodontosauridae, the 12-meter-long Acrocanthosaurus, which inhabited the eastern North American continent at the beginning of the Cretaceous period, stands out. This predator could not run fast, but it had very strong forelegs that it used to hold its prey against itself and prevent it from escaping. 
In case of a long starvation, Acrocanthosaurus had a thick fat compartment on its back, running along almost the entire spine. Interestingly, the fingers on the Acrocanthosaurus hands bent in both directions not only towards the palm, but also vice versa. In the middle of the Cretaceous all of the Carcharodontosauridae became extinct. The second family of Cretaceous carnosaurs is the Neovenatoridae. This includes not-so-huge animals, up to 9 meters long and up to 4 tons in weight. These were smaller versions of the Allosaurus. Now we should talk about the more advanced theropods. These are the Cellurosaurus. These animals ran fast and many of these species had plumage designed not to fly, but to stay warm. In the larger chlorosaurs, which lived in warmer climates, the feathers fell off when mature and were no longer needed. With equal body size, the Cellurosaurus had a brain twice as large as that of the theropods previously discussed. The structure of the brain of Cellurosaurus became closer to that of a bird than to that of a crocodile. The best-known subfamily of the Chlorosaurus is the Tyrannosauroids. Tyrannosauroids ranged in size up to 14 meters and weighed up to 7 tons. Tyrannosaurs were found only in the northern hemisphere of the Earth, on the fragments of the former continent of Eurasia. And on the small islands of Cretaceous Europe Tyrannosauroids quickly became extinct. In the southern hemisphere their ecological niche was occupied by ceratosaurs and carnosaurs. The Tyrannosaurid family belonged to the largest carnivorous animals ever to inhabit the planet. Tyrannosaurids used their front paws to hold small prey before gnawing on it. It is also likely that males clung to females with their small paws during mating to keep them from falling the front paws also served as an aid for the predator to get up off the ground after sleeping. Unlike other theropods, tyrannosaurs could not only chew chunks of meat off the carcass, but could also normally carve their prey. These theropods could gnaw through bones and suck out bone marrow, crack open the rib cage and get to the tasty and nutritious innards. The largest and most famous Tyrannosaurus was Tyrannosaurus. It was up to 14 meters long. Its skull, more than a meter long, had large, sharp teeth. Each tooth was about 16 centimeters in size. Adult Tyrannosaurs were clumsy but they could run fast and could reach speeds of up to 30 but usually paced at about 17 kilometers an hour. Tyrannosaurus' step was 4 meters. Tyrannosaurs did not like to run, because with such weight, any fall resulted in severe injuries. The skeletons of almost all old tyrannosaurs show evidence of heel fractures. A newborn Tyrannosaurus was the size of a newborn ostrich. By the age of two, the Tyrannosaurus had reached 30 kilograms. A 10-year-old Tyrannosaurus weighed 300 to 400 kilograms. A 14-year-old theropod weighed about 1,800 kilograms. Then came a period of rapid growth, and by the age of 18 the animal was sexually mature and weighed about 4,200 kilograms. Growth then slowed greatly, but seemed to continue throughout life, which in Tyrannosaurids was not very long. The oldest known specimen lived 28 years and weighed 5,400 kilograms at the end of its life. Tyrannosaurus rex is probably better known than the other dinosaurs. In addition, it is likely that it is one of the last dinosaurs that ever lived on Earth. Another member of this family was Tarbosaurus. Thanks to its powerful jaws and strong teeth, Tarbosaurus easily ripped through the thick bone shell of the herbivorous Scalosaurus. The next family of the suborder of theropods is Compsognathidae. In the Jurassic, these small dinosaurs were no bigger than a rooster, but became larger in the Cretaceous. Up to two and a half meters in length and up to 30 kilograms in weight. The plumage of the Compsognathids was soft and fluffy, like that of today's kiwis. Compsognathids fed on lizards and mammals. The small long-tailed Cynosauropteryx. 
It was the only dinosaur with a roughly known lifetime coloration like the modern raccoon. Cynosauropteryx had remarkably long index fingers on its hands longer than its forearms. Another subfamily called Ornithomimosaurs. These were medium-sized dinosaurs, up to 6 meters long and up to 440 kilograms in weight. The creatures were similar to ostriches and had the same small heads with large eyes. Many Ornithomimosaurs grew a beak. Among the Ornithomimosaurs, the giant Deinochirus stood out. It was the longest theropod in the history of the Earth. The animal could reach a length of up to 20 meters together with its tail, and weigh up to 9 tons. Ornithomimosaurs were fast. Theropods had a maximum speed of 80 kilometers per hour. Ornithomimosaurs were omnivores. Predators ate small animals, lizards, frogs, fish, and the eggs of other dinosaurs. Ornithomimosaurs also ate fruit, which they plucked straight from trees, ducking the branches with their hands. Manoraptors Among the Manoraptors, there was the strangest superfamily of theropods. These were the Therizinosaurs. These dinosaurs were herbivores. The size of these theropods could reach up to 12 meters. The largest Therizinosaurs weighed more than 6 tons, almost as much as a Tyrannosaurus. Therizinosaurs had a large and blunt bird beak instead of teeth. There were so-called termite killers. Alversaurs. Small dinosaurs that fed exclusively on termites. Another infraspecies worth paying attention to. These are oviraptors. The physique of these animals resembled that of ostriches. Many species had a rooster comb on their heads. Some oviraptors were carnivorous, some omnivorous, some herbivorous. This group was very diverse. Some animals were the size of a modern smartphone, while others were up to 8 meters long. Some oviraptors weighed a few grams, while others could reach up to 2 tons. But Avamimum were very fast runners and could reach speeds of up to 70 kilometers per hour. All further Manoraptors belong to a group called Paraveses. Secrets of the Mesozoic Era Cretaceous Period The Paraveses include an infraspecies called the Deinonychosaurs. Deinonychosaurs are divided into two families, a large family and a small family. The large family is called the Dromaeosauridae. The main distinguishing feature of Dromaeosaurids is a large, curved claw, which was used as a weapon or to climb trees. The tails of Dromaeosaurids were long and richly feathered. The animals could wave their tails from side to side like dogs. Dromaeosaurid tails could be used as an aerodynamic rudder when turning on the run. Dromaeosaurids ranged in size from 60 centimeters to 7 meters in length along with the tail. Larger dromaeosaurids hunted in packs, like modern wolves. Smaller predators could climb trees like martens and monkeys. Many dromaeosaurids were fast runners, reaching speeds of up to 70 kilometers per hour. The 1 kilogram micro raptor. It is the only living biplane known to science. The animal had two pairs of wings. On the forelimbs and on the hind limbs, in gliding flight, the hind wings were placed under the forelimbs. It could not take off from the ground, but could only hover from one tree to another with a loss of altitude. Velociraptors were covered with feathers and weighed no more than 20 kilograms. These predators climb trees like macaques. By the way, one of the Velociraptor's relatives, Cynornithosaurus, was the oldest lizard with a poisonous bite. Most likely, like modern predatory snakes, Cynornithosaurus used its venom to immobilize its prey rather than to kill it. 
The second small family from the Deinonychus group is the Trudonians. The size of the Trudons was also varied, from half a meter to three meters. They could weigh up to 60 kilograms. Some Truton species laid eggs in oviraptor nests, like cuckoos today. Truton is the only dinosaur with the largest brain. It is believed that Truton began to evolve towards intelligence. Had there not been a catastrophe at the end of the Cretaceous period, it is likely that intelligent life on Earth would have appeared 50 to 60 million years earlier. The Order Sauropods These animals, like modern giraffes, specialized in eating branches and leaves from tall trees. Jurassic macronarians were as big as 44 meters and weighed up to 200 tons. At the beginning of the Cretaceous period, the brachiosaurs were replaced by titanosaurs, which were distinguished by their small heads, wide chests, and more flexible spines. The Bruchatkasaurus in this group may be the largest terrestrial animal in Earth's history. Some of the smaller titanosaurs were covered with large, non-thick bone scales. Diplodox, which specialized in eating meadow vegetation, declined in the Cretaceous period and finally became extinct in the middle of it. Cretaceous Diplodox were up to 20 meters in size and did not weigh more than 7 tons. Ornithopods These animals were the first in Earth's history to learn how to chew their food, allowing these creatures to feed on tough vegetation. A small group of Cretaceous ornithopods called Iguanodons appeared. These were large animals up to 13 meters long and up to 6 tons in weight. The giants lost their ability to run very fast, but acquired protective gear. Iguanodon probably grazed in large herds and fought together against predators. Tenontosaurus was up to 8 m long and weighed about 1 ton. The animal had no camouflage, no danger signals. Tenontosaurus was very slow, moving only on four legs. But the herbivore had an unusually long tail that was used as a weapon. The evolutionary strategy of the Tenontosaurus was a failure. In the mid-Cretaceous, these animals were eaten by the Deinonychus, the last and largest superfamily of ornithopods. These are the hadrosaurs. Hadrosaurs could move both on two and four legs. Gadrosaurs had a fully formed beak on the muzzle. In some species, the beak resembled a duck's beak, but the mouth contained up to 1,500 small chewing teeth, which were constantly falling out and being replaced by new ones. Hadrosaurs could reach 6 meters in length and weigh up to 23 tons. Some hadrosaurs, like Gryposaurus, grew large, fleshy noses instead of ridges. Brachylophosaurus had a peculiar bone cap on its head. Brachylophosaurs and Edmontosaurs often had cancerous tumors. Apparently, this was a special genetic glitch of these two closely related genera. Some gadrosaurs lived in polar regions. It is thought that the herbivores migrated to places with warmer climates for the winter marginocephalus. This is another large group of herbivorous dinosaurs. Most marginocephals belong to the Infrorder ceratops, distinguished from other dinosaurs by their distinctive beak like herbivorous turtles. Like ornithopods, ceratopses were covered with thin scales. Ceratops also learned to chew grass properly and by the end of the Cretaceous period, they too had grown many small interchangeable teeth in their mouths. The smallest and most primitive family of ceratopses. These are the psittacosaurs, only 2 meters long and 20 kilograms in weight. The offspring of Psittacosaurus have been hunted by many predators, including mammals. Almost all Psittacosaurs died in the teeth of predators or from natural disasters. Psittacosaurs thrived for the first third of the Cretaceous period, after which they became extinct. Leoceratops, 
Eumaceratops, Archaeoceratops, and Araceratops, like the latter, lived at the same time as Psittacosaurs. These animals did not reach more than 1 meter in length. Leptoceratops reached 4 meters in length and weighed 200 kilograms. These herbivores had a small crest of bone on their heads to protect the neck from predator bites. The fourth and final, most numerous and evolutionarily advanced family of ceratopsies. Ceratopsidae. These animals were up to 12 m long, weighing up to 12 tons, and had finally forgotten how to walk on two legs, and their heads had grown not only a protective collar, but also three horns. Only the largest predatory dinosaurs dared to hunt the huge and heavy ceratopsids. Even in some cases, adult ceratopsidae represented too dangerous opponent. Among ceratopsidae, the subfamily Centrosaurini is distinguished by the bizarre shape of the collar and sometimes the presence of additional horns on it. The most striking possessors of beautiful equipment were Styracosaurus. Styracosaurs had nasal outgrowths, horns and six horny spikes on the back edge of the bone shield. The heads of the animals reached up to two meters in length. The spikes and horns made Styracosaurus dangerous for many predators. This was the end of the Ceratopsis. Marginocephalus had one small infraspecies, Pachycephalosaurus. These small bipedal herbivores weighing up to 40 kilograms had a thickened skull, which was used by the animals in much the same way as modern sheep use their horns. Pachycephalosaurus males were probably among the dinosaurs, the absolute champions of bashing. If such duels really took place, then such a powerful defense must have prevented the brawlers from blowing each other's brains out. After all, the opponents were probably facing such force that the strain on each head could have been 20-fold. Another suborder called Thyreophores. The first representatives of the Thyreophore Stegosaurus began to die out at the beginning of the Cretaceous period and by the middle of the period had become completely extinct. The Stegosaurs were replaced by Ankylosaurs. They were armored plant-eating, living tanks. At the very beginning of the Cretaceous period, this infraspecies split into two large families, the Notosauridae and the Ankylosauridae. By the standards of Ankylosaurus, Notosauridae armor was light, it protected only the upper, dorsal, half of the body, and gaps were formed between the plates when moving. The second family of Ankylosaurs, Ankylosauridae. These animals had much more powerful armor. Many species had a heavy bone mace at the end of their tail, with which they could break the bones of predatory dinosaurs and if they were lucky enough to hit. Unlike Notosaurids, adult Ankylosaurids were virtually invulnerable. No one hunted these creatures, but it was at the price of less mobility. Adult ankylosaurids were solitary animals. Only young individuals formed herds. Ankylosaurids were up to 9 meters in size, weighing up to 6 tons. Birds, already able to fly well, emerged that challenged the skies with older pterosaurs, gradually supplanting the latter. Archaeopteryxes became completely extinct. Some birds, however, did have teeth. In the Cretaceous period, ducks, half-lipped geese, loons, and plovers appeared, almost indistinguishable from modern versions of these birds. These are the Hesperornis. The first waterfowl. Hesperornis had 96 teeth. Young teeth grew inside the old teeth and were replaced as soon as the old teeth fell out. Hesperornis are very similar to the modern loon. Moving around on land was very difficult for this bird. Lifting the front, part of the body and pushing off the ground with its legs, Hesperornis moved in small jumps. However, the bird felt free in the water. It dived well, and it was very difficult for fish to avoid its sharp teeth. Ichthyornis, contemporaries of Hesperornis, were the size of a pigeon. The birds flew well. The wings were strongly developed and the breastbone had a high keel to which powerful pectoral muscles were attached. 
the beak of Ichthyornis had many small curved backward teeth. The small brain of Ichthyornis resembled that of reptiles. In the late Cretaceous period, toothless birds appeared, whose relatives, flamingos, still exist today. Pterosaurs were still patrolling the skies of the Cretaceous. Pterosaurs had come a long way since the Triassic and many new forms of flying predators had evolved. Rampharynchus became extinct at the very beginning of the Cretaceous. Only the pterodactyls remained. The first family of pterodactyls, the Istiodactylidae, had duck-like beaks with teeth hiding inside. The wingspan was 5 meters. Ornithochirids could reach a wingspan of up to 12 meters and were characterized by a distinctive vertical ridge on the end of their beaks. A whole series of walking with dinosaurs is devoted to the giant Ornithochirus. Pteranodontids with a wingspan of up to 9 meters had a large and sometimes bizarre crest on their heads. The giant tailless reptile Pteranodon from the family Pteranodontidae flew over the ocean and fed on fish. Pteranodon is one of the most highly evolved pterosaurs. The giant probably used its enormous wings, wingspan up to 18 meters, to hover freely over the ocean. Some of the fish caught at sea were in a special throat pouch to feed their cubs. Tenochasmatoids were relatively small, toothy pterodactyls. This pterodactyl, like a flamingo, roamed the shallows, filtering water through its large beak and filtering out the crustaceans it ate. Jungaripteroids, with a wingspan of up to three and a half meters, had distinctive beaks. Long and sharp at the end, but strong and massive at the base. Jungaripterids specialized in eating mollusks, crabs, sea urchins, and other similar animals prominent among the Jungaripterids is Nemecolopterus, which migrated to the forest, shrunk to the size of a sparrow, and is virtually indistinguishable from a small bird. This pterodactyl, however, quickly became extinct, unable to withstand the competition with real small birds. Tapajarids, with wingspans up to 5 meters, were distinguished by a huge meter-long comb sail on their heads. As darkids had a wingspan of up to 14 meters and weighed up to 250 kilograms. These were the most advanced sea pterodactyls, with long toothless beaks and an aerodynamically perfect body shape. Quetzalcoatl was the largest flying creature of all time. But the giant pterodactyl did not fly very well and led the lifestyle of a stork, not an albatross. Now back to the last great group of Cretaceous archosaurs. These are the crocodilomorphs. The marine thalatozoans, up to 6 meters in length, became extinct at the very beginning of the Cretaceous. And the small, 1 meter long primitive protozoans gradually became extinct, but still survived until the end of the Cretaceous. The place of protozoax and previously extinct Sphenozoax was taken by Notozoax. Notozoucus are also terrestrial crocodiles, but a bit more advanced. Notozoucus reached up to 4 meters in length. Marilosuchus and Cymozoucus ceased to be predators and mainly ate fruits, nuts, and root vegetables. There were also completely herbivorous species among Notozoucus. Armadillosuchus was the Mesozoic analog of the modern armadillo, armadillo. Little parasaurids separated from Notozoucus at the end of the Cretaceous and occupied the ecological niche of foxes and jackals. Neozoucids reached up to 10 meters in length and are considered to be the direct ancestors of modern crocodiles. Neozoucs were almost indistinguishable from their present-day descendants. The largest of the Neozoucus is considered to be the 10-meter-long Stomatozoucus. Stomatozoucus abandoned its predatory lifestyle and began to feed on plankton. Stomatozoucs may have been eaten by Spinosaurus. Plesiosaurs with long necks and small heads that ate small fish and shellfish made up the lion's share of the Cretaceous Sivropterygii. These animals could not swim fast, but they were very maneuverable. Plesiosaurs served as the prototype for the Loch Ness Monster. 
But unlike this mythical character, plesiosaurs could not stick their heads high out of the water and stare around. Just as a swimming man could not stick his head up to his waist out of the water and look around. Elasmosaurids. This is the largest family of Cretaceous plesiosaurs. The animals reached a length of up to 20 meters and weighed up to 14 tons. Libonex was characterized by a very stiff neck, fixed almost its entire length. Polycotyloids, polycotyloidae, reached a length of 6 meters and were distinguished by shorter necks and larger heads. The scaly reptiles of the large group Lepidosauromorphs. Mosasaurs. These are very large marine lizards that lived in the Cretaceous seas. Predatory giants occupied the ecological niche of marine crocodiles and were at the top of the food chain. They were quite aggressive animals. Many mosasaurs show traces of healed fractures and bites on their bones, apparently obtained in fights with their kind. Mosasaurs up to 15 meters in length are considered typical, as if reference mosasaurs, occupying an average position in most characteristics. Pliplotycarpines up to 7 meters long. They were relatively small mosasaurs, feeding on small fish and mollusks. The largest of the Cretaceous mosasaurs were tylosaurids, whose size reached 17 meters. Predators hunted the largest prey. For example, Hainosaurus ate even sea turtles. Scientists have analyzed the remains of one Tylosaurus. It is known exactly what the predator ate before it died. A shark, several bony fish, a Hesperornis bird like a penguin, and a small mosasaur of another species. The other half of the genera of scaly reptiles of the Cretaceous period were lizards, as well as snakes and bipeds that had just separated from them. At the same time, the first Varenobacteria appeared. Caganias was up to one meter long with its tail, and was the first Varen on Earth. Xianlongzai was the first iguana-like lizard that could glide from tree to tree. Ichthyosaurs gradually became extinct during the Cretaceous and finally died out at the end of the period. Cretaceous turtles were virtually indistinguishable from modern turtles. Cretaceous turtles ranged in size up to four and a half meters, weighing up to two tons. Most species were aquatic. The first beast-like animals appeared as early as the Triassic, over 200 million years ago. They were small, timid brutes who spent most of their time looking for insects to eat. In the first 100 million years, the bestial creatures barely touched by evolution. In the first half of the Cretaceous, major evolutionary changes began to take place among these inconspicuous mammals. The first marsupials and placental mammals appeared. It was these groups of animals at the end of the Cretaceous and beginning of the Cenozoic era that were to succeed the dinosaurs. The marsupial branch gave rise to the nearly modern possums and the egg-laying branch to the nearly modern platypus. At the end of the Cretaceous, something very strange and mysterious happened. Belemnites, ammonites, pl pliosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs disappeared overnight in the seas and oceans. On land, all the dinosaurs suddenly died out, and not a single pterosaur remained in the skies after the end of the Cretaceous period. Scientists have been puzzling over the mystery of this mass extinction for decades. This was the second large-scale extinction of life forms on our planet in the history of life on Earth. There are many hypotheses as to why the dinosaurs died out. Some researchers believe that the main cause was mammals, of which there were many at the end of the Cretaceous period. According to other researchers, the main reason for the mass death of dinosaurs was a dramatic change in the physical and geographical conditions at the end of the Cretaceous period. Cooling and drought led to a sharp decrease in the number of plants on Earth, as a result of which the giant dinosaurs began to feel the lack of food. 
Following the herbivores, the carnivores became extinct. In addition to the global climatic changes that took place, it is believed that the Earth collided with a giant asteroid, leading to the eventual extinction of many species. Sixty-five million years ago, the first Cenozoic period began. Paleogene period. This period is quite huge and is divided into three epochs. Paleocene, Eocene and Oligocene. The Paleogene marked a kind of rebirth of the animal and plant world after the massive extinction that wiped out all the dinosaurs. The surviving mammals became the basis of the animal world. The climate on Earth became more continental. Ice caps and eternal ice formed on the highest mountain peaks. The diversity of flowering plants and insects increased. Bony fish dominate the world's seas and oceans. Primitive cetaceans show up. New groups of corals are born. New species of urchins populate the ocean floor. Monet-shaped nummy-like shells become permanent inhabitants of the boundless seas. Most invertebrates of the Paleogene differed from invertebrates living in today's seas. The Paleogene period was marked by a rapid flowering of mammals. A new fauna of our planet was born. Among the marsupial mammals were herbivores. These animals resembled modern kangaroos and marsupial bears. There were also predators. The marsupial wolf and the marsupial tiger. Many insectivores lived near bodies of water. Some marsupials adapted to life in trees. Marsupials gave birth to immature cubs, which were then nurtured for a long time in their skin pouches on their abdomens. But primitive marsupials didn't survive on land like placental mammals. These animals became extinct, unable to withstand the harsh climatic conditions elsewhere on the planet. Only in Australia, which was early separated from the other continents, did the evolutionary process seem to stand still. The marsupial kingdom has survived to this day. The Paleogene period is characterized by an uneven distribution of fauna over the continents. Tapers, Titanotherians evolved predominantly in the Americas. The trunks and carnivores in Africa. The marsupials continue to live in Australia. Thus, gradually the fauna of each continent acquires an individual character. Many toothless birds, characteristic of our time as well, appeared. But along with them lived huge flightless, running, birds, completely extinct in the Paleogene. These are Diatrima and Fororacos. Diatrima was two meters tall with a long, half-meter long beak. Each of its strong legs was equipped with four toes and long claws. Diatrima lived in the arid steppes and fed on small mammals and reptiles. Fororacos reached one and a half meters in height. Its sharp, hooked, half-meter long beak was a formidable weapon. Because this bird had small, undeveloped wings, it could not fly. The long, strong legs of the Fororacoslav show that the birds were excellent runners. According to some researchers, the homeland of these huge birds was Antarctica, covered with forests and steppes at the time. What was the animal life like in the Paleocene, which came just after the extinction and lasted 10 million years? Let's take a look. At that time, the continents were still in motion. Gondwana was still splitting apart. South America was now completely cut off from the rest of the world and had become a kind of floating ark. A unique mammal fauna was born on this continent. In the Paleocene, the first Juliads appeared. They were the most interesting snails in nature. New varieties of sea urchins and foraminifers appeared. 
Cretaceous ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and other predators of the time were replaced by bony fish and a wide variety of sharks. The dominant species was the rayfish. Among them are the almost modern perch, herring, catfish, and pike. Paleocene sharks became more and more similar to modern sharks. The first modern genera appeared. The leopard shark and the rusty nurse shark. The largest Paleocene shark was the Otitus, which reached a length of 9 meters. Other Paleocene sharks reached only 3 meters in length. Some paleontologists speculate that, in the first million years of the Paleocene, there were still single species of dinosaurs in some places. Critosaurus, for example. But even if dinosaurs really did live in the early Paleocene, it didn't last long. Here are the three main groups of mammals. The monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. The first bestial animals appeared on Earth about 200 million years ago. But these protozoans were no match for the dinosaurs, so they waited patiently and secretly for about 150 million years. The mammals of the early Cenozoic boasted a diversity of species. Some early mammals remained insectivorous. The first shrews and hedgehogs ate crawling insects, challenging competitors such as frogs and toads for food. Did insects that flew stay safe? That didn't happen either. Some mammals took to the air and went after flying insects, which represented unlimited food resources. There were plenty of food niches left empty after the dinosaurs died. For this reason, some early mammals shifted to a diurnal lifestyle and diversified their diets considerably. Early mammals evolved into many groups of animals of very different shapes and sizes, allowing these animals to inhabit almost any habitat. Insectivores remained the smallest. Larger animals became active hunters or fed on carrion. Amblypods were clumsy animals that ate leaves and other vegetation. Flat-footed, carnivorous creodonts may have been no larger than an ermine or, conversely, may have been larger than the biggest bear. Allotherians also dominated mammals in the Mesozoic and were some of the most diverse animals of the Paleocene. These animals were small in the Cretaceous and became much larger in the Paleocene. Only three species of cloaca mammals have survived from the Paleocene. These are two species of echidnas and one species of platypus. They are found only in Australia and New Guinea. The first marsupials inhabited North America about 100 million years ago. Later, in the Eocene, these animals spread across all continents except Africa and Asia and made their way to Australia via Antarctica. The marsupials are more highly organized animals than the cloaca, but, despite this, the Paleocene marsupials were represented exclusively by possums. In the Paleocene, many placental mammals remained small animals, somewhat similar to their Cretaceous ancestors. But soon these animals began to seriously compete with the marsupials. The ability to maintain a constant body temperature, a progressive reproduction method and a large brain allowed these mammals to become a thriving group of animals and gradually established their dominance over the entire surface of the globe. The Lavraciotes were very diverse, ranging from 12 centimeters to 2.5 meters and weighing from 60 grams to 650 kilograms. The evolutionary race in the Paleocene was won not by those animals that adapted better to their ecological niches, but by those that were the first to occupy them. Hoofed predators, as well as clawed and fanged goats, were common in the Paleocene. 
The second most abundant genus was the order Mesonychians. They were the ancestors of modern cloven-hoofed animals as well as, surprisingly enough, whales. The first Mesonychians were predators, but they also had hooves on their feet. This group included Sinonyx, which had many of the small traits present in cetaceans. The most interesting thing is that no other animal had such traits. Therefore, Sinonyx is considered the direct ancestor of cetaceans. Condylarthra were the ancestors of cloven-hoofed ungulates, trunked animals, and even whales. The cloven-hoofed animals include modern pigs, deer, antelope, and others. Unpaired ungulates include horses, tapirs, and rhinoceroses. Some condylarthra transformed the claws on their toes into hooves some still lived with claws. When the last sauropods became extinct, local shrews had to urgently grow and transform into goats, cows, and rhinoceroses. Carnivora morphs. These were the ancestors of modern beasts of prey, as well as wyverns. In the Paleocene, they were small carnivores up to 80 centimeters long, like ferrets and mongooses. Many of these small animals lived in trees. Large burrowing herbivores called dinocerates appeared. In the Paleogene, a large superorder called Euarchontogliers originated. Euarchontogliers was the common name for rodents, primates, and woolly woolly creatures. The animals were small and omnivorous and many lived in trees. These creatures divided into two groups, one of which was named primates. The Zavropsids were a branch of the four-legged vertebrates that included reptiles and birds. The largest group of this class is called the Crocodilomorphs. The group was part of the modern crocodilian order, which made up 13% of all genera. Paleocene crocodiles were up to four and a half meters in size. Some crocodile species lived in the water. Some lived on land. And Pristichampsis crocodiles could run on two legs, like dinosaurs. In the Paleocene, there was the Ceratozoochus. It was the only crocodile known to science with horns. Why Ceratozoochus needed horns is unknown to science. The other 13% of the Paleocene genera were birds. These included geese, ducks, penguins, owls, cranes, flamingos, pelicans, cormorants, petrels, plovers, casuars, and pelagornithids. Pelagornithids were similar to modern albatrosses, but very large and with teeth in their beaks. Also in the Paleocene there was a bird similar to the modern crane. It was the Presbyornis. At that time there lived a flightless bird called the Diatrima. Diatrima was up to 2 meters tall and weighed up to 100 kilograms. It is worth mentioning the Wyman, which was the ancestor of all penguins and the emu ostrich. This genus originated exactly in the Paleocene. The scaly reptiles gave rise in the Paleocene to the largest snake in the history of the Earth. This is the Titanoboa. The snake could be up to 15 meters long. At its widest point, the diameter could be 1 meter. The Titanoboa could weigh up to 1,135 kilograms. One of the scaly mammals survived to this day. It was the two walker Rhinura. Among the Paleocene sauropsids, it is also worth mentioning the small aquatic reptiles Chorostotera, which look like crocodiles but are not related. After the Paleocene came the Eocene. This occurred 55 million years ago and lasted for 23 million years. This period brought higher temperatures to the Earth. The climate on Earth became milder and warmer. Warmer than in the Mesozoic. By then, our planet had finally recovered from the last mass extinction. That had wiped out all the dinosaurs. The diversity of life forms had reached Mesozoic levels. This is plankton. 
a buoyant mass made up of large quantities of small algae and small animals. Plankton are an integral part of the world's oceans. These algae lived even in the most secluded corners of the Eocene seas. In the ocean depths, new species of mollusks appeared. Crustaceans like crabs and hermit crabs also appeared. Snails represented the majority of mollusks in this era. In the Eocene, the extremely poisonous sea snail, the cone snail, appeared. Of the cephalopod mollusks, only the nautilus, which still lives in our seas today. In our seas to this day. Nothing significant happened in the echinoderm world. The flat sea urchin appeared. Sometimes this creature is called the sand dollar. Also in the Eocene, the sea lily pentacrinites became extinct. Many bony fish of all shapes and sizes appeared in the Eocene seas. Lakes and rivers all over the planet were astonished by the great diversity of freshwater fishes. The diversity of ray-finned fishes also increased dramatically. Fish actively filled available ecological niches. Perch. This is the largest order of Eocene fishes. This order includes high-bodied tropical acantheroids up to 70 centimeters long. The most famous modern representative of the acantheroidae is the surgeon fish. Mackerel fish have also appeared, including the modern genus Tuna. The barracuda, the angelfish and the parrotfish. The most popular fish species called herring or herring also appeared in the Eocene. It was also during this period that nature gave birth to creatures such as hedgehog fish, eels, codfish, oyster catchers, as well as carp, catfish, flounder, salmon, scorpionfish and many others. The famous tiger shark was in the dominant marine life of the time. The deep-sea goblin shark appeared, surviving to this day without noticeable changes. Also from modern genera came the popular sawfish. Stingrays were not exactly widespread in the Eocene, but they were no longer a semi-extinct, but ceased to be a semi-extinct curiosity. In the insect world, ants became widespread. The largest ants in the history of the Earth lived in the Eocene. The size of working individuals, which reached a length of 3 centimeters. The wingspan of males reached 15 centimeters. It was also at this time that modern bees appeared. In the Eocene, many new groups of mammals evolved from the plant-eating mammals of the Paleocene. At the very beginning of the Eocene lived the small five-toed ungulate condylarthros. These fast-legged animals were the common ancestors of modern horses, cows, pigs, tapirs, rhinos and deer. Corypidon and Uintotherium. Corypidon belonged to the suborder Pantodons. It was one of the largest mammals that fed on leaves and fruits. Corypidon led a semi-aquatic life. This animal lived in swamps, like the modern hippopotamus but it wasn't related to the hippopotamus or any other modern mammal. Uintotherium was a member of a dinoceret that lived in the Eocene period. It had three pairs of horn-like growths on its head. The growths were covered with skin, like giraffe horns. Uintotherium had powerful upper fangs for extracting earth roots that were deeply embedded in the ground. The animal's legs were as wide as an elephant's. Rodents predominated among small mammals. The ancestors of today's lemurs, tarsiers and golagos half-monkeys lived in trees. At the end of the Cretaceous, carnivorous sharks and some species of predatory bony fish took the place of huge marine reptiles. And some species of predatory bony fish. But some terrestrial mammals also returned to the sea to participate in the, the former domains of ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. Among these animals were the mammals from which whales later evolved. 
The first fossilized whales are known from the Eocene. These aquatic mammals evolved from a group of predatory hoofed mammals that who reverted back to an aquatic lifestyle. At the same time, the first ancestors of animals familiar to everyone appeared on land. Moles, camels, rabbits and voles. And towards the end of the Eocene, the first cats, dogs and bears appeared. The Eocene was a time when many new families of animals flourished. The family Anthracotherium. This family included animals that looked like small hippopotamuses. As a result of evolution, the first pig-like animals appeared at this time. In the ancient forests of our planet, the deer like Leptomerixes, and the semi-aquatic raccoon like Indochius. Eocene Mesonychians adapted to eating fish rather than vegetation. For example, Pachycetidae lived mainly on land, and fed both on land and in water. The Ambulocetidae fed almost exclusively in water. They were peculiar mammalian crocodiles, up to 3 meters long and weighing up to 300 kilograms. Basilosaurids have gone the furthest in their adaptation to aquatic environments. Basilosaurs are considered the first whales. Unlike modern whales, these animals had a second, rear pair of fins. And many species had fingers sticking out of their fins. In fact, they were not whales, but mammalian analogues of the Mesozoic Mosasaurs. Basilosaurids were originally thought to be marine lizards. This was reflected in the animal's name. Basilosaurus reached 21 meters in length and was the largest animal of the Eocene. Other basilosaurids did not exceed 5 to 6 meters in length. Whale ancestors had not yet mastered echolocation. One of the largest land predators of the Eocene is Andrusarchus. 5 meters long and weighed about 1 ton. The animal had a skull nearly a meter long and could eat even the largest of herbivores. And could feed on even the largest of herbivores. Andrew's arcs were sedentary and omnivorous, like modern bears. Brontotherians. They were stocky and thick-skinned, nose-like creatures, weighing from 2 kilos to 1 ton. The smaller brontotherians looked more like boars than rhinos. Eohippus, the ancestors of modern horses, were small animals. Forest thickets that turned into swamps. These were the habitats of the Eohippus. The small animals had five toes on their front feet and three hoof toes on their hind feet. Eohippus had a small head on a short neck and had 44 teeth. Eocene horses weighed between 20 and 55 pounds and ran slowly. In the Eocene, the ancestors of rhinoceroses appear. The hornless animals were small, only up to two and a half meters long. At the end of the Eocene, the Uintotherians evolved from them. Uintotherians had three pairs of horns each, dagger-shaped long fangs, and a very small brain. Titanotherium. Living in grasslands near numerous rivers and lakes, Titanotherium were the size of, of modern elephants. The giants had large, branched horns. The Titanotherium's teeth were small. This suggests that the animals fed on soft vegetation. Tapirs also appeared in the Eocene. The largest Eocene tapirs, weighing up to 300 kilograms, are from the modern genus, tapirs, which evolved in the Eocene and have remained virtually unchanged since then. Smaller Eocene tapirs quickly became extinct. Mammalian Predators The largest family of Eocene predators is the Myacidae. These were coon-like animals weighing about 2 kilograms. The first pseudospecies appeared. This species split into the dog and bear families. 
But then the future bears and dogs were similar to wyverns and raccoons. The first cat-like creatures were not of the feline family. These creatures looked like lynxes and panthers, but the animals had a gait like bears. Also in the Eocene, the first hyenas appeared. Corypidon and Hypercorypidon occupied the ecological niche of the modern dwarf hippopotamus. Hippopotamus, Stilinodon, weighing 80 kilograms, used its fearsome teeth to dig root vegetables out of the ground. Copidodon saber-toothed squirrels lived in the trees. These small animals had disproportionately large fangs, which they used either for self-defense or to fight between males. The small, wolf-like predatory creodonts did not yet have true predatory teeth. In the Eocene, true predators with real dangerous teeth evolved from them. In the course of evolution, all members of the canine and feline species evolved from these predators. They were the beta version of mammalian predators. These animals had an unfortunate lower jaw design that made it impossible for them to nibble on bones and eat medicinal herbs. In addition, the brains of these creatures were less developed than those of true predators. Here are examples of beta versions of the following predators. The 60-kilogram hyenodon was the creodont analog of the modern hyena. Patriophilus. This is the creodontian analog of the leopard. Macaroids is a saber-toothed cat the size of a palace cat. Sarcastodon is the largest of the Eocene creodonts. This animal reached 700 kilograms like a modern big bear. Only Megastotherium was larger than Sarcastodon. Megastotherium is the largest predatory land mammal of all time. A huge creodont weighing almost 1,000 kilograms. The head of the Eocene predator was twice the size of the head of the modern grizzly bear. The first bats appeared in the Eocene. Icaronicterus was the first bat, very similar to modern bats with wings made of patches of skin stretched tightly over long, thin fingers. This insect-eating animal hunted at night, when other aerial predators would not fly because of the darkness. Rhinoceros-like dinosaurids with boar-like fangs and strange horny protrusions tried to flourish in the Eocene, but failed. By the end of the Eocene period, these animals were extinct. In the Eocene, the first hedgehogs appeared. They were very peculiar animals. For example, Pholodocircus, in addition to needles, had scales on its head in the form of a bone helmet, and the tail was long and scaly, like a lizard. Some Eocene hedgehogs fed not on insects but on fish. And one species of hedgehog ate only ants. Some ancestors of monkeys and lemurs lived in trees. These animals ate fruit and insects. Ancient monkeys and lemurs had long tails and limbs with well-developed fingers. With well-developed toes to help them climb trees. Within the largest superorder of primates was the largest suborder of wet-nosed monkeys. They were small arboreal animals up to 6 pounds in weight and all looked alike. Our distant ancestors the dry-nosed monkeys lost their developed sense of smell and began to rely mainly on sight. In the Eocene, dry-nosed apes differed little from their wet-nosed relatives. Rodents, too, sought to occupy as many ecological niches as possible and became more diverse. Rats, squirrels, beavers, and many others. In the Eocene period, the ancestors of modern trunks appeared. These were animals the size of a modern taper. The tusks of these creatures were small, and the trunk was an elongated upper lip. From them came the Dinotherians, whose lower jaw sloped downward at right angles. At the end of the jaws were tusks. Dinotherians had real trunks. 
The animals lived in humid forests with lush vegetation. At the end of the Eocene, the first representatives of elephants called paleomastodonts appear. The first representatives of toothed and toothless whales also appear. Paleomastodonts already had two pairs of tusks on the lower and upper jaws. But these animals did not yet have a proboscis. Paleomastodon was the largest of the Eocene proboscideans. The animal weighed up to two tons. Other species were smaller. The smallest Eocene proboscideans did not exceed 15 kilograms. Eocene Afrotherium sirens. The largest of the Eocene sirenians was the dugong, reaching lengths of up to 5 meters and weighing up to 600 kilograms. These animals have survived to the present day, virtually unchanged. Arsenotherium. This is the African analog of the rhinoceros. Arsenotherium had a pair of large and small horns each. The body length reached three and a half meters. The distant descendants of these animals are called domans. These are small ungulates living today. South American ungulates in the Eocene evolved sluggishly and produced nothing interesting. They were mostly omnivorous creatures like pigs and about the same size. In the Eocene, a strange animal appeared called Leptictidium. It was an animal like a kangaroo with the nose of a puffin. The predator reached 90 centimeters in length with its tail. In the Eocene, there was also a mysterious anteater called Eurotamandua, up to 90 centimeters long. It is not at all clear what order this animal belongs to. The Eocene mammals also include opossums and platypuses, familiar to us from the Paleocene. Penguins have become very widespread. The largest of these birds reached a height of almost 2 meters and a weight of 100 kilograms. They were the largest penguins that ever lived on Earth. Interestingly, all Eocene penguins had long and sharp beaks, like those of herons. In the superorder Galonseri, which includes chickens, ducks, and geese, the Gusagerival presbionis and Diatrima gastrini continued to live, but before the end of the Eocene, both birds became extinct. The Diatrima, a fast-footed, terrible crane, nearly two meters tall, lived in North America. It had an enormous beak, similar to a parrot's beak, and monstrous claws, which Diatrima used to finish off and tear apart its prey. Apparently, Diatrima was a fearsome enemy of the early ancestors of horses, and it is likely that this bird could easily have eaten a horse. On the sea coasts in the Eocene lived quite modern cormorants and loons. Also found in the Eocene were huge toothed pelagornithidae with wingspans up to 6 meters. These birds with huge wings occupied the ecological niche of the giant pterodactyls of the Cretaceous. The first swifts, falcons, parrots, herons, flamingos, and woodpeckers appeared. Owls were widespread. Crocodilomorphs greatly reduced in numbers in the Eocene. Alligators were widespread first, gavials second, and crocodilians third. The size of Eocene crocodilomorphs reached up to 6 meters. The bipedal crocodile Pristichampsis became extinct in the Eocene. Among the scaly reptiles, the first venomous snakes and the first land tortoises appear in the Eocene. Crocodile like Choristodera also continue to exist. The amphibious frogs, newts, and salamanders continued unchanged. At the end of the Eocene, the vast ocean of Tethys began to change into the shallow Mediterranean Sea and lithospheric plates in India began to push up the Tibetan Himalayan mountain system. The Earth became noticeably colder. A glacier began to form in Antarctica. All this led to the moderately large extinction event that marks the end of the Eocene. However, this extinction can only be called moderately large by Cenozoic standards. Compared to the extinction of the dinosaurs, it was nothing.
And by Cambrian standards, it wasn't an extinction at all, it was normal everyday life. The Oligocene was the last epoch of the Paleogene. At this time, the Earth experienced a cooler climate than in the previous Paleocene and Eocene epochs. A huge ice sheet formed over the South Pole. To form such a cover, nature required huge amounts of seawater. Because of such changes on the planet, the water level in the world's oceans began to drop rapidly and the land area increased significantly. The cooling led to the fact that tropical forests were displaced by forests that preferred cooler climates and steppes, which occupied vast areas of the planet. Climate change has had a significant impact on the planet's ecosystems and biodiversity. During this period, there were several significant changes in the Earth's climate. First, India moved closer to the equator, resulting in increased rainfall and higher temperatures. This led to the development of tropical forests and increased biodiversity in the region. Second, Australia and Antarctica finally parted, leading to a change in ocean circulation and climate change in both regions. Third, South America became an isolated island, allowing unique animal species such as sloths and armadillos to evolve. Mollusks. This is one of the most diverse classes of animals on Earth, comprising more than 130,000 species. These creatures live in virtually all habitats, from the depths of the sea to freshwater. In the Oligocene, about 34 million years ago, mollusks continued to evolve and adapt to new environments. Gastropods became the dominant genus. Helix and pupilla snails appeared. Cephalopod mollusks also continued to evolve, but the number of these creatures decreased. Among the bivalves, Pteridina appeared. Fishes continued to evolve in the Oligocene and the Raffin fishes remained dominant. The largest of the ray fishes is the swordfish. Swordfish appear among this order. In the second place, catfish and the detachment lampreforms. In this period, new fish species such as mullet, needlefish and smelt appeared. In addition, Macrurus, a deep-sea cod, appeared. Scorpions and echinoderms also evolved and became an integral part of the world's oceans. In the Paleocene, Carcharodon appeared. This extinct shark was one of the largest representatives of the family Carcharinidae. At present, only fossil remains are known, however, from them we can conclude that Carcharodon were large predators, reaching 18 meters in length. Megalodons. These giants were extinct marine predatory sharks. The predators lived during the Paleogene period and reached sizes up to 25 meters long and 30 tons of weight. Megalodons preyed on large marine animals such as whales, dolphins and sea turtles. During the Oligocene period, the giant shark or Ceterinus maximus appeared. And this predator has survived to the present day. Ceterinus maximus has a massive body with a short and wide snout that is used to grab prey. This shark can reach a length of up to 6 meters and a weight of up to 7 tons. The predator feeds on fish, squid and other marine animals. Simnodon. This is a species of raffin fish from the family Ciliarinidae of the order of sharks. These fish are distributed in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. They are found at depths of 110 to 180 meters. The maximum recorded size of 91 centimeters. They feed on small fish, squid, crustaceans, and cephalopods. 
reproduce by egg laying. Hemipristis. These are ray-finned fishes in the family Hemipriididae of the Scutosauridae. These creatures are distributed in all tropical and subtropical regions of the world's oceans. Hemipristis are found both at depths of up to 1,000 meters and near the surface. The maximum recorded size of these fish is 2 meters. These sharks feed predominantly on smaller fish. Nantabirostris belongs to the family Niliobatidae of the tailfin division. These rays inhabit the tropical waters of the Indo-Pacific region. The maximum recorded length is 3 meters. These stingrays have a very distinctive body and head shape that can be mistaken for the head of a shark. Miliobatidae have a body shape that allows them to camouflage among coral reefs. Yet these animals are quite large and have a high swimming speed. Reproduction in stingrays occurs by egg laying. The diet of these stingrays consists mainly of small fish, as well as shrimp and squid. The spread of steps to ever larger areas of land has led to a rapid increase in the number of herbivorous animals. During the Oligocene epoch, new species of mammals, including rhinoceroses, appeared. In addition to rhinoceroses, the first true pigs and buffalo appeared in the Oligocene. Finally, the first deer appear in the Oligocene. Animals with unusual digestive systems appeared that allowed them to digest plant food efficiently. One such animal was phytophage. This is an animal that feeds exclusively on plant food. Nature began to reward animals with what is known as a ruminant stomach that could digest exclusively plant food. During that era, the ancient camel Poebrotherium lived on Earth and was one of the earliest ruminants. At the end of the Oligocene, about 25 million years ago, a new group of plants appeared on Earth. They were grasses. What makes these plants unique is that, unlike all flowering plants, new leaves grow not at the top of the stem, but at the base. As a result, if grazing animals eat the old leaves, new leaves quickly grow in that place. Thus, by the time the next herd arrives, the fields are ripe with a new and hearty lunch. This process of constant renewal of food resources means that the grassy plains can feed large herds of herbivorous animals. From this time onward, evolution produced a great variety of herbivores, and since herbivores proved to be easy prey on the open plains, these animals were followed by a host of new predators. By the end of the Oligocene, the first true cats and dogs had appeared on the planet. In South America, the Oligocene saw rapid development of mammals. During this period, new species appeared that were different from animals found in other parts of the world. One of the most interesting facts is that many of these animals had unusual traits that helped them survive in the harsh conditions of South America. For example, some of the animals had long tails that were used for balancing on trees, as well as large ears that helped them hear sounds in the forest. Another example. Ancient Pyrotheria resembled an early elephant with its half-trunk and chiseled tusks. And Thylacosmolus was a large marsupial animal that looked like a saber-toothed cat. The animal possessed long, curved fangs and powerful claws. In ancient South America, there were many incomplete toothed mammals such as anteaters, armadillos, and sloths. These animals had a number of unique features that helped the animals survive in the jungles of South America. For example, anteaters had a long trunk that they used to find food. And armadillos were covered in thick armor that protected them from predators. Sloths, on the other hand, were slow and heavy animals that spent most of their time in trees. 
These are the Oreodonts, a family of Oligocene mammals. These herbivores fed on the leaves and shoots of trees. Among the Oreodonts was the subfamily Leptokeniani. It included small animals that looked like dwarf donkeys. These animals had short legs and lived in deserts. Camelidae is a family of calluses that lived in the Oligocene. The animals were similar to modern camels and had a long neck and hump. However, unlike modern camels, these creatures did not live in deserts but in prairies and occupied the ecological niche of antelopes. Camelids weighed between 50 and 520 kilograms. Family Protoceratidae. This is evolution's attempt to create a fast-moving antelope on the genetic basis of the camel. These true mutants had horns not only on their heads but also on their snouts, making these creatures look like rhinoceroses. The Cenotherium ungulate hare was one of the strangest calloused animals that lived in the Oligocene. Anthracotheriidae are another representative of the Eocene parnopods. These are the distant ancestors of modern hippos. But while Anthracotheriidae was the size of a normal hippo, Bothriogenes and Elomerix were less than a meter and a half long. The family Entelodontidae, which separated from the general lineage of pigs as early as the Eocene, was finally formed. These very unsympathetic boars were over 2 meters tall and weighed over 400 kilograms. Entelodontidae were predators and hunted primitive camels as well as small rhinoceroses. In the Oligocene there was a great variety of small animals that we rarely mention. The Parnopods Hypertridulidae. These small animals not more than 9 kilograms lived in the jungle and fed on vegetables and fruits. We can't fail to mention a strange creature called Leptomerix. It was a small deer-like ruminant with a very slender body. During the transition from the Eocene to the Oligocene, the ancient whales became extinct and those that remained finally lost their hind limbs and divided into two modern suborders, toothed and mustached whales. Toothed whales in the Eocene were as small as two and a half meters and were almost indistinguishable from modern dolphins. The first cetacean to master echolocation in the late Oligocene was Kentriodon. Kentriodon lived in the late Oligocene about 25 million years ago. This small representative was the first cetacean to master echolocation, which allowed the animal to better navigate in the water and avoid predators. Mustached whales were larger than toothed whales in the Oligocene, but differed from the former only in minor details of anatomy and nutrition. Instead of whale whiskers, mustached whales had normal teeth and subsistence consisted of fish. Echolocation ancient mustached whales have not yet mastered. The canine family, which originated in the Eocene, became prosperous in the Oligocene. Hesperociana. These were small, up to 36 kilograms in weight, fast-footed predators like foxes and jackals. Then there were Barophagus, which were even smaller. Just under 2 kilograms in weight. The largest family of the superfamily was the Amphicyonidae, which were large and stocky animals. Amphicyonidae had powerful jaws and sharp teeth, which allowed them to hunt large prey such as deer and mammoths. Cynodictus were the smallest members of the superfamily Arctoidea and lived in burrows. Predators preyed on small rodents and shrews using their sharp teeth and claws. In the Oligocene, among the Arctoidea bears, the first species appeared that was more cat-like than bear-like. This was Ursavus gidlii. This is due to the fact that at that time there were significant changes in the environment and some species were adapting to the new conditions. Ursavus gidlii was one such species that became more agile and fast-moving to better adapt to its new environment. 
In addition, its appearance may have been related to the fact that it lived in forests where there were many trees and dense vegetation that could create shade and camouflage it from predators. At this time, during the Oligocene epoch, two new groups of animals evolved from the general lineage of dog-like animals, which was a group of mammals. These were the martens and the pinnipeds. The quals, in particular, were the most advanced evolutionarily and became the ancestors of many modern mammals such as minks, sables, and ferrets. Pinnipeds, on the other hand, are a group of animals including ducks, geese, gulls, and other waterfowl that evolved from a common ancestor with dogs. 28 million years ago, the first true cats appeared, which were small arboreal predators. The first cats lived in forests and fed on small animals. The mantle and the lynx are direct descendants of these animals. Now we will tell about Oligocene ungulates. Among all the few ungulates, the most outstanding animal is worth telling about. It was Indracotherium. Another name for the animal is Paraceratherium. It was a megahorse, 8 meters long, 5 and a half meters high at the withers. That's almost an elephant and a half. And weighing up to 20 tons. That's four elephants. It was the largest land mammal that ever existed. In fact, it was the mammalian equivalent of the Jurassic Brachiosaurus. But this animal had a much easier life than Brachiosaurus. There were simply no predators to stop Indracotheriums living. Indracotheriums ate a soft, plant-based diet. When the climate became arid, these giants died out from lack of food. In North America, true horses gradually evolved. These were descendants of the Orohippus, Mesohippus. The horses were small, up to 55 kilograms. The animals had three toes on each foot, the middle toes being larger and longer than the lateral toes. This allowed ancient horses to run fast on hard ground. The small, soft hooves of the Ohippus adapted to soft, swampy soils, becoming a true hoof. Mesohippus were already the size of a modern wolf. The animals inhabited the Oligocene steppes in large herds. The brain of Mesohippus was already about the size of a modern horse. After the Mesohippus came the Merisippus. These were horses the size of donkeys. Merisippus had cement on their teeth. Some rhinoceroses in the Oligocene began to grow horns on their snouts. Another interesting animal lived in the Oligocene, Calicotherium. It was an unfortunate copy of the Cretaceous Therizinosaurus on a different genetic base. These beasts used their long arms to bend tree branches and eat leaves. The hooves on the hands and feet of Calicotherium had turned back into claws. Brontops was the last of the Brontotherians. And Metaminodon was the Hippopotamus ungulate counterpart. The modern taper emerged, unchanged from that time. Brachippus sideros. An oligocene bat that was very similar to modern bats. Numerous insect eaters, particularly prehistoric hedgehogs, were found at that time. The last simulests were living out their days. The number and diversity of primates declined markedly in the Oligocene. This was because there was less jungle. Some monkeys became accustomed to hanging under branches on their hands rather than running on all fours. These primates gradually became humanoid. They were small monkeys, weighing between 1, 5 and 7 kilograms. These creatures had brains no bigger than those of other Oligocene apes. The first hairs appeared. Pika. In dense forests lived the first true hare called Paleologus. Paleologus did not yet know how to jump and gallop, 
but hid from predators in burrows like marmots. Placental Mammals Afrotherians The largest group of Afrotherians, these are the Proboscideans. Many members of the Proboscideans have finally come to resemble modern elephants. Eritreus is an almost normal elephant about the size of a cow. Baratherium was the size of an Indian elephant, but evolved toward hippopotamuses. Baratherium's tusks and trunk shortened almost to the point of being indistinguishable. The famous genus Mastodon appeared. The second great group of Oligocene Afrotherians, these are the now extinct Desmostility. The animals were a bit like herbivorous sea lions. Also included in the Oligocene Afrotherians are the Daemons, Cyrenians, and the nose like Arsinotherium. Pyrotherians and Astropotherians were something like small hippopotamuses. Pachyrucos was the South American equivalent of the rabbit. Rhynchopus was the South American equivalent of a pony. And Stromachenia was an animal that looked like an unfinished giraffe. It's worth looking at the Oligocene partially toothed animals. These were sloths and armadillos. A special place in the evolutionary chain was occupied by marsupials. The largest group of Oligocene marsupials are representatives of the bipedal marsupials. In the modern world, this group includes kangaroos and wombats. In the Oligocene, the bipedal marsupials were represented by the small kangaroo-like predator Echeltodeta. Also representing the top of the Oligocene food chain was the marsupial lion. It was one of the largest marsupial predators of all time. The marsupial lion reached up to 160 kilograms. An interesting feature of the animal was its strong and agile forelimbs with opposable thumbs. Apparently, the marsupial lion grabbed prey not with its teeth, but with its hands. In the Oligocene, the modern family of predatory marsupials was formed. The first representatives of this period were small, like foxes and small dogs. Also in the Oligocene, the first bandicoots appeared. These were large marsupial rats that jumped like kangaroos. Monotremes are still represented only by platypuses. Echidnas have not yet appeared. Zoropsids of the Oligocene Pelagornithids, huge toothy albatrosses with wingspans up to 6 meters. Forarecos, flightless birds of prey that have occupied an empty niche of large predator in South America. The representative of Forarecos parafasornis reached 2 meters in height and weighed up to 110 kilograms. But most other representatives of Forarecos had much smaller sizes. For example, Solopterus weighed only 7 kilograms. The first modern genus appeared in the stork family. It was the night heron. Flamingos differed little from their modern representatives. Penguins were larger than they are today. Up to 1.5 meters in height and weighed up to 90 kilograms. Ancient penguins had long, thin beaks like herons. Also in the Oligocene, the first modern genus of hawks, buzzards, and the first hummingbirds appeared. Some Oligocene crocodiles, such as the 5-meter-long Australian Quincana, did not hide in water bodies, but ran briskly on land. Gaviolosuchus was the largest of the Oligocene crocodiles, reaching lengths of almost 10 meters. Most Oligocene turtles already resemble modern turtles. But the Australian Myelanias resembled an armored horned beast with a long ossified tail, similar to the Mesozoic Ankylosaurs. Among the scaly reptiles of the Oligocene, several may be mentioned. These are the large snake Urlunger which reached 6 meters in length and the spindle lizard Peltosaurus. The aquatic lizards Choristodega continued to exist. The Oligocene amphibians are still the same frogs, salamanders, newts, and worms. 
At the end of the Oligocene, the Earth suddenly experienced global warming, so much so that the Antarctic glacier almost melted. In the Miocene, extremely interesting events took place. The climate changed so quickly that the animals had to literally sit on their suitcases. Most animals preferred warm habitats. When cold came on a certain territory, the migration of heat-loving animals became especially intense. The inhabitants of the Miocene made long journeys and invaded lands with a temperate warm climate. And local animals had to deal with uninvited guests. There were constant skirmishes for a real place under the sun. And the former owners had to leave their habitat and look for a new home. Some animals went to the territories from which the invaders came to them. There was a kind of animal exchange. Such large-scale migration influenced the serious and rapid evolution of many groups of mammals in the Miocene. At the end of the early Miocene, for the first time after a long period of mutual isolation, there was a significant exchange between Africa and Eurasia. The main effect of this exchange was the change in the African fauna. Cats, dogs, martens, rhinos, calicathers, and pigs appeared in its composition. Probably at the same time, proboscideans emigrated from Africa to the Indian subcontinent. The first mastodons settled in Europe and North Asia in the early Miocene. At the same time, Ancateria immigrated to Eurasia from North America. The most significant event in the history of the early Miocene rodents of Europe was the immigration of Asiatic hamsters, which no longer differed in appearance from modern descendants. In the Miocene, the first bovids and giraffes entered Africa from Eurasia. Miocene. This is the time of extinction of creodonts. However, in Asia in the middle Miocene, two genera are still present. The largest representative of the Provaverini, Desopsilus, is the size of a modern jackal, and a very large representative of the Hyanodontini, Hyanaleros, which was the size of a tiger. It is interesting to note that both of these genera are common in Asia and Africa, and Hyanaleros hainaler is also present in Europe. This confirms the exchange of creodont fauna between Asia and Africa through Europe in the Oligocene. The ethological features of the group probably contributed to the extinction of the creodonts. The consequence of this is an increase in control over spontaneous activity and aggression. This large predator was less aggressive than modern large representatives of the carnivore order Carnivora. An ecological corridor has formed through Asia Minor, the Middle East and Northern Arabia to Afghanistan and China. This is what scientists call the unusual process of animal migration. The main animal exchanges between Eurasia and Africa pass through this corridor. The most rapid evolution of the most diverse groups is taking place. Hedgehogs, shrews, moles, pikas, squirrels, jerboas, hamsters, and numerous subspecies. Also, hyperevolution did not pass by various types of primates, rhinos, ruminants, proboscis, mustelids, dogs, hyenas, cats, and other animals. The Miocene can rightly be considered an epoch of great diversity of animal species, in the formation of which one of the leading roles belonged to the territory of Asia. The spread of the steppes and the gradual disappearance of forests in the Miocene strongly influenced the growth of the populations of herbivorous mammals. Fewer trees, less energy, which is so necessary for any animal. Imagine for a moment an ordinary tree. It spends most of its energy on creating a support for itself. To this end, the tree develops a special solid trunk and many branches. In a temperate climate, animals can consume only a very small part of the edible substance produced by a tree in a year. On deciduous trees, leaves generally grow for only six months of the year, and fruits and seeds, 
with the exception of nuts, appear for only a few weeks. This means that temperate forests can feed only a limited number of animals in a year. The sharp increase in the amount of grass on land in the Miocene epoch meant, in fact, the emergence of a fundamentally new source of food. However, at first, it was not easy for herbivorous mammals to use the resources of this bottomless pantry. Some animal species even became extinct because they could not adapt to a herbal diet. Mammals, whose teeth were designed for chewing soft leaves, found it difficult to switch to such a tough and fibrous food as grass. For such animals, the herbal diet meant constantly increased chewing, and the teeth of herbivores quickly wore out, creating serious problems for these animals. After all, mammals do not have an unlimited supply of teeth, and toothless jaws mean inevitable starvation for them. Despite all this, in the Miocene mammals became much more numerous and diverse. Many herbivorous species of animals arose. By this time, the ruminant stomach has become an ideal mechanism for digesting grass. As a result, a kind of explosion took place in the Miocene, giving rise to new species of herbivores capable of chewing gum. Ruminants can fill their bellies with a huge amount of food, which can be digested later. Moreover, if a predator attacks a ruminant, it can run away from it, taking with it a supply of food for several days in advance. Once in safety, the animal can, without too much haste, digest the food it has eaten. During this kind of ruminant revolution, the number of ancestors of the current antelope, buffalo, deer, giraffe and sheep has increased dramatically. When Antarctica and Australia separated, a new ocean current formed that swept the entire world. Known as the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, it has caused global climate change and a massive upsurge of deep-sea nutrients. At the same time, kelp forests began to spread around the world. The oceans were primed for a rapid increase in biodiversity, and among this explosion of life were marine mammals. First of all, these were baleen whales. These whales appeared about 34 million years ago, but this was the first time that many new species appeared. There were over 20 different genera of baleen whales in the Miocene compared to today's six. It was also the first time that whales began to increase in size, with some species reaching lengths of over 10 meters. One, Balanoptera sibaldina, may even have rivaled the modern blue whale in size, although scientists have not yet reached a definitive conclusion. Toothed whales also became much more numerous at this time. One line even became the top predator of the oceans along with sharks. These were macroraptorial sperm whales. There were many species, and all of these sperm whales were adapted to hunt other marine mammals rather than small prey such as fish, squid, or plankton. The teeth were huge, conical in shape, and the jaws could open very wide. The jaw muscles were obviously very strong, which gave even more bite force. The largest of all these hypercarnivorous sperm whales was Liviatin melvillii, perhaps the largest active predator ever. The whale could reach 17 and a half meters in length. Each of the teeth was 30 centimeters long. These are the largest teeth, apart from tusks, in an animal that has ever existed. Being such a massive animal, the ancient sperm whale could probably prey on just about anything, including other whales. Leviathan's main competitor was probably Otodus megalodon, an, an incredibly hyped shark of comparable size in modern popular culture. 
Giant sharks flourished in the Miocene for the same reasons as marine mammals, and the megalodon was the largest of these animals. Another Miocene sperm whale, much smaller and less well known, is Raphacetus. Raphacetus had a very long, slender beak jaw, filled with rows of tiny teeth adapted for quick capture of fish. In fact, the predator was like a sperm whale trying to become a river dolphin. Since we are talking about dolphins, some of them also decided to get into the cohort of super large animals. Among the squalodons there were various species, some the size of a modern killer whale, but much more toothy. Initially, when squalodons were discovered, these predators were mistaken for dinosaurs, and they got their name because of the shark-like teeth. At that time, there were many families of toothed whales that are now extinct, including the antecedents. Perhaps the strangest Miocene cetaceans were the Otobinocetopsids, with fragile crocodile snouts. One genus in this group, Otobenostops, had a bizarre pair of asymmetrical tusks protruding backwards from a broad muzzle. It may have been sensory organs, as these tusks were probably too fragile for actual combat. Otobenostops had powerful lip muscles, but nothing like teeth, other than tusks. This indicates that they fed by sucking food by picking mollusks from the seabed, like a walrus. And that's just cetaceans. During the Miocene, the evolution of pinnipeds, seals and their relatives, accelerated at the beginning of the era, most of them were semi-aquatic creatures similar to otters, and by the end they already resembled modern species. One of these early, primitive pinniped relatives was called Ponomos. It was built like a bear and was originally related to raccoons, but it turned out that it was actually the predecessor of seals. The huge neck muscles and strong molars of Kalpanomos indicate that it was a specialized eater of hard-shelled mollusks and similar foods, so it was very similar to a giant sea otter. As pinnipeds evolved, they became more and more like their descendants today. A new family of desmatophysids has evolved, related to modern walruses and sea lions. The largest species, Allodesmus, was a large animal, about 2, 5 meters long. What's really interesting about Allodesma? If you look at the cross-section of the teeth, you can see the peculiar growth rings at regular intervals. This is presumably due to the fact that the males stayed on the beach during the mating season to protect their harem of females. During this time, they did not go to sea in search of food so their teeth did not wear down at all. In the end, the groups of pinnipeds known to us today appeared otobenids, walruses, oteriids, eared seals, and faucids, real seals. The walrus family was particularly diverse at that time, with at least 18 species, as opposed to one today. The largest of these was the formidable Pontolus magnus. With an estimated weight of up to 4,000 kilograms, this beast was the size of an Asian elephant and is undoubtedly one of the largest predators that has ever existed. For greater intimidation, he had four tusks instead of two. Another genus, Pelagiarctos, had a similar build but was not as large. At the opposite end of the spectrum was the adorable Nanodobinus, the smallest member of the walrus family known. About a meter and a half long, and it didn't even have tusks. Then came the Otariids, represented today by sea lions and fur seals. They were not as diverse as the Miocene Otobenids, but there were some very interesting species among them. For example, Thalassolian was huge, the size of a modern walrus. He lived in California. Oddly enough, Thalassolian literally translates to sea lion even though it was a fur seal. It is believed that this is the direct ancestor of the northern fur seal, an ancient species that arose in the subsequent geological period, the Pliocene, and still exists. Finally, real seals from the Phocite family appeared. 
They differ from other pinnipeds mainly in the absence of external ears. One of the interesting genera was Prepusa. It is possibly the smallest marine mammal ever to have existed, measuring around 60 centimeters in length. There were quite a few species, one in what is now the Netherlands and several in Central and Eastern Europe. At that time, the last region was the bottom of a huge inland sea Paratethes, the last remnants of which today are the Black and Caspian Seas. The second genus is Hadrochirus, which is larger and not as harmless. Found on the Pacific coast of South America, it was related to modern Antarctic seals such as the leopard seal reached about 2-5 meters in length, and the jaws had strong teeth, ideal for chewing solid food. It may have gnawed on mollusk shells or even bones. The Thalassocnus sloth was ideally adapted to a semi-aquatic lifestyle. With dense bones and a long, beaver-like tail, as well as strong jaws for eating seagrass. However, on land, this animal was clumsy, because it had weak neck muscles. Since it spent most of its time with its head on the seabed and fragile legs. Like hippos, it probably grazed in shallow water. Modern three-toed sloths are quite closely related to Thalassocnus, and are also surprisingly good swimmers. Finally, a few words should be said about otters. Like every other group of animals in the Miocene, these guys also suddenly grew huge. The largest member of the mustelid family in history was the Miocene otter. And Hydriodon, which is estimated to have weighed a staggering 200 kilograms. This lion-sized beast was technically not a marine mammal, as it lived in the freshwater lakes and swamps of Ethiopia. Strong, crushing teeth indicate that it ate a lot of solid food, perhaps turtles, crocodiles, armored catfish, bivalves, and the like. At the same time, he may have hunted terrestrial animals. A close relative, in Hydrotherium, also grew very large and could be found in what would become Mexico and the southern United States. Siamagale lived in the wetlands of China and Thailand. Its weight is estimated at about 50 kilograms, which is comparable to the weight of an adult wolf. The great thing about all the animals featured is that it's only a small part of what makes the Miocene era unique, because at the same time you had a lot of giant sharks and penguins, the first pastures, megafauna on land, a huge number of mega animals in the Amazon basin and throughout South America, dominated by reptiles rather than mammals. Antelope-like pronghorns lived in North America. The bizarre horns of these animals grew right on the tip of the nose. Throughout the Miocene, horses continued to increase in size. Marigippus was the size of a pony today. The middle toe on each foot was disproportionately large compared to the same toe of its predecessors, and it can be said that Marigippus walked on tiptoe all his life or rather, did not walk, but ran very quickly. Numerous tubercles on the molars helped him chew tough grass. Previously, horses were forest dwellers and ate tender and juicy foliage. However, by the beginning of the Miocene they had adapted to life on the open plains. Now elephants have become much more similar to their modern representatives. Mastodon. Scientists call this animal by another name. Platabelodon or spade tusk. The animal could make its way through the thickets like a heavy bulldozer. From the lower jaw protruded wide spade-shaped fangs, with which the animal dug various plants from the soil. Deinotherium was much larger than Mastodon. With the curved fangs of his lower jaw, he may have pried at the edible roots like a large pitchfork. We can get some idea of the Miocene ecosystem if we turn to its modern counterpart, the East African savannas. 
The grassy plain provides different types of food for a variety of animals. In the savannas of East Africa, zebras nibble at the rough tops of grasses, and wildebeests nibble at their leafy central parts. Gazelles, on the other hand, look for protein-rich seeds and shoots near the ground. Warthogs often kneel to reach the shortest grass or dig up edible bulbs and tubers from the ground. There are also herbivores in the savannas, who find food above the level of the tallest grasses. For example, a black rhinoceros eats tree bark, thin branches and foliage, but an elephant eats both grass and tree leaves, often absorbing up to 250 kilograms of vegetation per day. Well, growth allows the giraffe to avoid any kind of competition, since this animal can cut off branches and foliage at a height of 6 meters from the ground. Thus, different types of herbivorous animals do not claim each other's food resources, and there is enough food for everyone. Perhaps it was the same during the Miocene. Different species existed at the expense of different parts of the ecosystem. In the same period, other new settlers appeared. At the beginning of the Miocene, the ranks of birds were replenished with new species of parrots, pelicans, pigeons and woodpeckers. A little later, the first ravens and falcons joined them. New mammals such as mice, rats, guinea pigs and porcupines evolved rapidly. A strange group of horse-like animals also appeared Calicotheria. With large claws resembling hooves, they dug up edible roots. From now on, animals could move freely from Africa to Europe or Asia and vice versa. A kind of two-way traffic soon emerged, with elephants migrating from Africa to Eurasia and North America, while cats, buffaloes, giraffes, and pigs traveled in the opposite direction. The first primates were small animals, similar to shrews. Primates appeared on Earth about 65 million years ago. Evolution continued to work in this direction, and by the middle of the Oligocene, two main groups of primates had formed. New World Monkeys in South America and Old World Monkeys in Africa and Asia. Soon another group of monkeys descended from the African branch, which became the ancestor of the great apes and, ultimately, humans. The brain of great apes is larger than that of their other relatives. In addition, primates do not have a tail, and long and strong arms are perfectly adapted for climbing trees and jumping from branch to branch. The fossil remains of a small anthropoid ape, which they called Egyptopithecus, Egyptian monkey, fell into the hands of scientists. This monkey lived in Africa during the Oligocene era, about 27 million years ago. No one can say with certainty that it was Egyptopithecus who was the ancestor of modern great apes, but this is not at all excluded. Shortly after the beginning of the Miocene, about 24 million years ago, another, more highly developed great ape appeared, Dryopithecus, similar to the current chimpanzees. These animals quickly moved from their African homeland, through land bridges to Europe and Asia. Apparently, Dryopithecus walked on two legs, but ran and climbed trees with the help of all four limbs. Perhaps the primate even carried food in his hands. So, the history of mankind was about to begin. This is the savanna five million years ago. The ancient shroud is almost no different from the modern one. Once upon a time, this place was covered with dense, boundless forests and impenetrable jungle. Now, due to climate change, these vast territories occupy a quarter of the ancient planet. Savannah cannot be called a dead desert. Life is also vibrant here. Just like in the thicket of the forest, in the mountains or on the underwater reefs of the world's oceans. Pliocene Epic
A time of global change in the world of flora and fauna. The world continues to change without stopping for a second. Pliocene epoch is the final epoch of the Neogene period. It was a time of sharp cooling of our planet. The rich fauna suffered significant losses. Many species of animals that massively inhabited the Earth disappeared in short periods of time. According to one version of scientists, cooling played a major role in this. Others believe that increased interspecific competition caused the extinction of many ancient animals. This is a musk ox, a unique animal originally from the Ice Age, outliving mammoths by 7,000 years. The musk ox is happy about the cold weather. Thick fur and unpretentiousness in food create complete comfort for this animal. Musk oxen are the most formidable mammals not only in the Pliocene. These animals have survived to this day and still live in four national parks and reserves. From the name itself it follows that the musk ox combines the characteristics of a bull and a sheep. Powerful, incredibly hard horns by the heritage of bulls. The animal got its short tail, which is hidden in thick fur, from rams. And although the musk ox is more similar in appearance to a bull, the closest relative of this animal is the mountain sheep. The musk ox's fur is thick and long, in some places it can reach one meter. Fur covers the entire animal, with the exception of the nose, lips, horns, and hoofs. The body weight of a musk ox can reach from 300 to 650 kilograms. This species is protected by the states of its owners. Among bovid American migrants in the fauna of North Asia were the musk ox and sorgelia. It was a large animal with an elongated muzzle. It resembled a modern wild goat. The horns were short and rounded at the ends. The animal fed on trees and shrubs. Against the general background of the relatively smooth evolution of Pliocene mammals, two events stand out that were of fundamental importance for the subsequent history of the Earth's biocenoses. The first of them is the appearance in northern Eurasia of the Vol family, whose representatives in the small size class have mastered feeding on the green mass of plants. This event is associated with the formation of a fundamentally new zonal type of communities, meadow steppes. However, voles themselves played and continue to play a significant role in the formation of soils and plant associations in the steppe zone of the northern hemisphere. Another even more important, and perhaps related to the first event, is the appearance of man. For communities of plants and animals on Earth, the increase in the number and population diversity of the genus Homo had catastrophic consequences. In the Pliocene era, South and North America were favored by glyptodonts. These are giant fossil armadillos, about 3 meters high and weighing more than 2 tons. The appearance of the Dotodont least of all resembled mammals. The huge dome-shaped shell made the glyptodont look like a land turtle. Glyptodont was a herbivore. This is evidenced by the absence of fangs and incisors in the animal. The armadillo's main defense against predators was its tail, covered with hard bone plates, with a club at the end. Waving such weapons, the glyptodont fought off enemies, of which there were many in the animal world of the Pliocene. In the Pliocene, grass continued to serve as an inexhaustible source of food for herbivores. Many animals that ate leaves died out, and more highly organized ruminants took their place. In Europe and Asia, vast grassy plains provided shelter for huge numbers of buffalo, deer, gazelles, and early varieties of antelope. The prairies of North America were inhabited by huge herds of deer, camels, horses, mastodons, and pronghorns. There were also short-necked giraffes, grazing among vast herds of other herbivores. Like other ruminants, giraffes ate grass. 
Gradually, the giraffe's necks lengthened, and these animals began to get their food from the treetops. The first hippopotamuses appeared in the Pliocene. Perhaps they descended from some pig-like ancestors. Researchers were able to find out that in those ancient times, several species of these fauna representatives lived on the Earth. Only two species of hippopotamuses have survived to this day, and both species live in Africa. It is assumed that hippos were originally forest animals, but a sharp decrease in the number of trees forced these animals to leave their favorite places and settle near water sources. Small and medium-sized predators lived in packs and hunted in groups of several individuals, creating pens and ambushes. This hunting strategy is still widespread today. For example, African wild dogs hunt in small packs usually no more than seven or eight animals. The victim is identified in advance, before the chase begins. As a rule, this is a still fragile cub from a grazing herd or a weak, sickly-looking animal. The strategy itself is very simple. The victim is separated from the herd and then relentlessly pursued until it is exhausted. When the poor animal slows down, the pack surrounds the prey and pushes it to the ground, with individual members of the pack grabbing the prey by different parts of the body, for the nose, tail, and belly. Prey can vary in size, but a small pack of African wild dogs can kill a zebra ten times the weight of any of its members. In the late Miocene and early Pliocene, South America was still a sanctuary for some species of unusual, toothless mammals. These were incomplete teeth. These included the armadillos, tree sloths, and anteaters. Among these creatures there were also large herbivores. For example, Toxodon. With its short limbs and wide three-toed feet, this animal resembled a rhinoceros. However, the placement of its nose, eyes, and ears suggests that it spent most of its life in the water, like a hippopotamus. The most famous carnivore of the Pliocene is considered to be the saber-toothed tiger, Smilodon, which lived in the Northern Hemisphere. A distinctive feature of this representative of the feline family were the huge fangs protruding from its upper jaw. Pointed fangs about 18 centimeters long served as weapons for Smilodon. Having caught up with its prey, the Smilodon plunged its fangs into the belly or throat of the victim and then also used these fangs to cut the prey into pieces. With its size, Smilodon resembled a modern lion or armor tiger. Moreover, the predator could weigh from 160 to 400 kilograms. In total, scientists were able to count five species of Smilodon, but none of these tigers survive to this day. Five million years ago, Ardipithecus cadaba lived on the territory of modern Ethiopia. This species was an intermediate link between apes and humans. The structure of the bones of Ardipithecus indicates the vertical position of the body when walking. The animal was already trying to walk on its hind legs. Anankis appeared five million years ago. These are today extinct proboscis animals. The height of the distant ancestors of elephants reached three and a half meters. The skull was short, high and narrow. The length of the upper tusks was up to three meters. Adult Anankis did not have lower tusks. Stegotetrabelodons these animals reached 4 meters in height and 12 tons of weight. These animals with a difficult name did not live long and within a short period became completely extinct. Maharids. The predators had relatively short fangs, weighed up to 220 kilograms, and hunted mastodons. The quest to see cow had a length of up to 9 meters and a weight of up to 10 tons. The Pliocene animal had hooves at the ends of short limbs. The cow had no teeth. Food was chewed in the mouth with two plates. 
The cow moved along the bottom, moving its front legs, or used a fin. This animal lived in shallow waters. Presumably it was a herd animal. Towards the end of the Pliocene, a narrow isthmus formed between North and South America, restoring the connection between the animal world of these two continents. Two-way traffic immediately arose across the isthmus, and a grandiose migration of mammals began. Neurologus This ancient relative of the hare was the size of a dog and could weigh up to 23 kilograms. The ancient animal lived on the island of Mallorca, and in the absence of predators, it became very large, well-fed and sedentary. Among the rodents were horned gophers. Gophers lived in burrows. It is unclear why these animals used horns, either for mating displays or for protection from predators. Servalces had a body length of up to 3 meters, a weight of up to 700 kilograms, and horns up to 2 meters wide. Hadrocura seals were up to two and a half meters long and fed on crustaceans and mollusks. Dromornis birds were up to three meters tall and weighed up to 500 kilograms. Dromornis were herbivores and could not fly. Five and a half million years ago, Thorpe Jarnarsson's crocodile appeared. It was the largest species of crocodiles, up to seven and a half meters long. This predator differed from other species of crocodiles by its wide muzzle. Presumably, the crocodile fed on human ancestors. There are no traces of the teeth of this animal on the bones of the ape people. But it is possible that Thorpe Jarnarsson's crocodile simply swallowed them whole. The Laophis viper could reach a length of 3 or 4 meters and weigh up to 26 kilograms. This made the Laophis snake the largest and most venomous viper in history. The Bluff Downs giant python could be up to 10 meters long and preyed on mammals, birds, and other reptiles. In Pliocene times, there were a large number of antelopes. Many were similar in body composition to bulls. At the end of the Pliocene era, Leptobos lived, which were close in structure to real bulls. In the Pliocene, the ancestors of camels and llamas developed elastic pads on their legs instead of hoofs, calluses. At this time, camels moved from North America to Eurasia and llamas to South America. Pigs were numerous in Neoplacene times. A characteristic feature of the late Pliocene was the appearance of some well-known megafauna. The woolly rhinoceros and mammoth are distributed in Eurasia and North America. These large animals survived until the Pleistocene era, when they became extinct due to climate change and collision with modern humans. At the beginning of the Pliocene era, the first hippopotamuses appeared, but Anthracotherium and giant pigs no longer existed on Earth. Titanis this prehistoric bird was certainly impressive. Adults reached a height of two and a half meters and weighed about 140 kilograms. Titanis wallery of the early Pleistocene closely resembled its theropod dinosaur ancestors, which went extinct 60 million years before the appearance of this bird. Giant birds of prey and theropods have a fairly similar structure. Locomotion on two legs, small forelimbs, and a massive head. Australia was isolated from other continents. Consequently, no significant changes in the fauna occurred there. The mysterious period of the Anthropocene. Pleistocene. The Anthropocene period is considered the shortest in the entire history of the Earth. This period began about 2 million years ago and continues to this day. Some of the main characters of this time were Snails Incredible! Of course, these creatures did not top the food chain and were almost invisible in the world, but they played an important role in the modern world. And they still play. Along with terrestrial mollusks, 
We find typical and alpine types of soft-bodied species in glacial deposits. Bivalves were in are found today in freshwater basins of African lakes and rivers. We can also observe these familiar creatures in various bodies of water around the world. Enough talking about snails. Let's talk about more interesting inhabitants of the Pleistocene era. One of the most interesting reptiles of the Pleistocene were land-running crocodiles. Quincana, my dear friend, is an extinct genus of Australian crocodilomorphs in the family Mecosuchians, close relatives of modern crocodiles. The greatest diversity of crocodile species could be observed in the distant Triassic period, but the quincans appeared much later, at the end of the Oligocene. This is approximately 23 million years ago. Scientists have discovered four species of quincan. The size of these monsters was impressive. The smallest of the species reached 3 meters in length, and the largest quincana was almost 7 meters long. But these crocodiles inspired horror not with their size, but with other abilities. These ancient predators did not sit in ambush in a reservoir for several days. Quincans walked through the forests of Australia like terrible maniacs in search of victims, and any animal that stood in the way of these monsters was doomed to death. This killer was helped by long legs located directly under the body, and not on the sides, like in real crocodiles. It was impossible to escape from this reptile by running away, because the quincana ran quickly, like an ostrich. No, slow down a little. If you think that you could hide in a lake or river from this monster, then you would be making a big mistake. Quincana was an excellent swimmer. One could only fly away from this predator. Rejoice, birds! How was Quincana different from the modern crocodile? These were teeth. Any crocodile that we can observe today hunts in the following way. The teeth of modern reptiles have a rounded conical shape. With such teeth, the predator pierces the prey and tears off parts of the body in small pieces. Quincana's teeth were capable of cutting its prey into even pieces. This is how we cut butter and vegetables today. Quincans shared their territories with other equally dangerous predators of that time. Palinarchus, this crocodile was the king of the Australian swamps at the beginning of the Anthropocene period. Unlike the Quincana, this predator sometimes behaved like an ordinary crocodile. The five-meter-long Palinarchus lay calmly, immersed in the swamp slurry, and waited for a gaping animal to pass nearby. And only hunger forced this giant to sprint over a long distance. Another interesting reptile of the Pleistocene was the huge Australian monitor lizard, seven meters long. The name of this animal is Megalania. Megalania was almost twice the size of a modern Komodo dragon. It was an active predator that attacked any animal that could not escape or hide under its shell. Megalania became extinct about 40,000 years ago. This happened when the first people arrived on the continent. There is no doubt that for them the gigantic monitor lizard was one of the most Russian enemies as well as a competitor for food resources. However, there is no direct evidence of deliberate human hunting for Megalania. This is Myelania, a very interesting turtle that lived in the Pleistocene in Australia. This giant was two and a half meters long and weighed 900 kilograms. Myelania's head was decorated with powerful horns. The long tail was armed with armored rings and spikes. So far, no one has figured out whether this was a weapon or an ornament. Science is silent about this. There were several other species of Myelania, but other species were smaller and not as well armed. Horned turtles disappeared at the end of the Pleistocene. This happened due to serious climate changes and the appearance of people in these places who gradually populated the territory of Australia. As you know, the continent called Australia was isolated from the outside world for a long time. 
Animals could not get there and the diversity of living creatures on the mainland was limited. Later in the Pliocene, Australian forests and grasslands were inhabited by bats and rodents. Australia's indigenous marsupial hosts have gradually evolved into a variety of highly unusual forms. In the Pleistocene, giant kangaroos three meters high appeared. Wombat-shaped animals the size of a hippopotamus appeared. It was a diprotodon or marsupial hippopotamus, genus Diprotodon, a huge herbivore from Australia. The largest individuals reached 3 meters in length and almost 2 meters in height. Sometimes scientists call this animal a giant wombat. It lived in open grass pastures and woodlands, most likely not far from water bodies. By the end of the Pleistocene, Diprotodon became extinct. This happened about 18,000 years ago. Another representative of that time is the marsupial lion. It was a very strange animal. The animal reached the size of a modern jaguar. The jaws of Phylocolio carnifex were as powerful as those of a lion. Powerful muscles testify to the enormous strength of this beast. There is no doubt that this beast was capable of felling the largest herbivores on the continent. The marsupial lion hunted diprotodons and giant kangaroos. The animal could sit on its hind legs, supported by a strong tail, as kangaroos do, and could climb trees like a leopard. The marsupial lion disappeared 30,000 years ago, at the same time as the rest of the Australian megafauna. Unique birds also lived in Australia. Geniornis, ostrich-like flightless birds. The height of this bird reached two meters, weighed up to 200 kilograms. It lived in the forests and steppes of Australia and became extinct 30,000 years ago. Geniornis was most likely a herbivore. There is a version that these unique birds could have disappeared because of people who were actively populating the mainland at that time. Recently, I was rock paintings of these birds, as well as the Tasmanian tiger, giant echidna, kangaroo and marsupial taper were found. One of New Zealand's most famous extinct birds was the flightless Mao bird. Some of them were no larger than a modern emu, but representatives of the genus Dinornis reached a height of more than three and a half meters and weighed a quarter of a ton. In the unique nature of New Zealand, which did not know mammals, moa occupied the ecological niche of large ungulates. The number of moas began to steadily decline after the arrival of the first settlers on the island, the Polynesians, who gave rise to the Maori tribe. People actively hunted these not too fast and stupid birds, and as a result, the last representatives of moa became extinct around the 16th century AD. Host's Eagle, Harpagornis moray. It was the largest eagle in the entire history of the Earth. The flying giant hunted Mao's flightless birds. When the Mao became extinct, this species of eagles also did not last long because the main source of food disappeared. Hosta became extinct around the same time as Mao. There were three species of huge lemurs living in Madagascar. Adult Megalodapus edwardsi were the size of a large orangutan, and the animal's skull with powerful jaws reached a length of 30 centimeters. Ancient lemurs were herbivores and led approximately the same lifestyle as modern koalas. Megalodapus existed for quite a long time and became extinct about 500 years ago due to active hunting and deforestation. There were several other genera of giant lemurs, Another species of lemur, the huge Archaeoindris fontoinanti, weighed about 180 kilograms and occupied an ecological niche in Madagascar close to South American ground sloths. Another species, Paleopropithecus ingens, was the size of a chimpanzee and lived in trees, where it ate succulent fruits and leaves. Like Megalodapus, it became extinct in historical times not without the active help of humans. Among the birds that lived in Madagascar, the most interesting are Epiornis. These were the Madagascar equivalents of the flightless moa. 
the largest Epiornis were over 3 meters tall and weighed 500 kilograms. Such individuals were the heaviest birds on Earth. The Epiornis egg was up to 35 centimeters long and the size of 160 chicken eggs. Before the settlement of Madagascar by humans, Epiornis had no serious enemies. The exception was crocodiles. This is the island of Mauritius, located in the Indian Ocean. The famous dodo birds lived on this island. But 400 years ago, sailors arriving on the island began to hunt these peaceful giants for their meat. In the 16th century, the Dutch brought pigs and monkeys to Mauritius, and the animals began to eat dodo eggs and their chicks. And then dodos completely disappeared from the face of the earth. In fact, all that remains of these large flightless pigeons are two heads, two feet, and a few skeletons, stored in various places, museums in Europe. But although no living person has ever seen a dodo, scientists know a lot about the creature's lifestyle. Since ancient ship logs and notes from travelers who visited Mauritius have reached us before the last of these birds became extinct 300 years ago. South America had its own world of animals. This world was no less strange and amazing than the Australian one. Several genera of giant ground sloths survived before humans arrived in the New World. The largest of them, Aramotherium, reached a length of 6 meters and a weight of 3 tons. These strange animals lived in open spaces. In the savannas and woodlands of South America, in the south of North America, and on the islands of the Caribbean, Aramotherium ate plant matter. Adult Aramotherium was practically invulnerable to predators. The skin of ground sloths contained small bone plaques that looked like chain mail. Neither a saber-toothed tiger nor a human spear could pierce the skin of a sloth. And the huge claws on the front paws were such a terrible weapon that if an enemy approached too close a distance, the Aramotherium itself became a dangerous enemy. In addition to the indicated 6-meter giant, several smaller varieties survived until the late Pleistocene. These sloths were about the size of a cow and weighed up to 300 kilograms. Ground sloths disappeared at the same time as all American megafauna, about 10,000 years ago. Giant armadillos also lived at the same time as giant sloths. Glyptodon clavipes, the most famous of them, reached a length of 3 meters, and Doodacurus clavicaudatus, more than 3.5 meters, was armed with a bone mace with spikes on its tail. These giants were clumsy herbivorous creatures, reliably protected from the dangerous fangs of saber-toothed cats and the powerful beaks that disappeared a little earlier than the four rocos. Giant armadillos became extinct 10 to 11,000 years ago. These animals were hunted by people and jaguars, which greatly contributed to the rapid extinction of the population of these animals. Macrachenia patagonica, an amazing mammal from South America that looked like a camel or a llama, but was not related to them. Macrachenia patagonica was about 2 meters tall and weighed more than a ton. The animal was distinguished by a relatively long neck, a wide foot with three supporting toes with something like hooves, and a small proboscis, with the help of which Macrachenia picked leaves and grass in the savannas and woodlands of Pleistocene America. Macrachenia became extinct at the end of the Pleistocene 10,000 years ago. This was due to climate change, active persecution by the first Americans and displacement by North American animals, which gradually colonized the southern continent. Notungulate. It was the South American equivalent of hippopotamuses and rhinoceroses. A relative of Notungulata was Toxodon. In the vastness of North America, there were two species of long-legged, short-faced bears. Unlike the relatively clumsy and omnivorous brown, black and cave bears, the giant flat-faced bear Arctodus simus was a true predator and active hunter, capable of catching up and killing very large prey. 
These were elk, camels, bison, and young mammoths. The size of the bear was impressive. Height it withers 1.6 meters. The height when standing on its hind legs is more than 3 meters, and its weight is up to a ton. At that time, there were two kinds of saber-tooths. Smilodon and Homotherium. Smilodon, the classic saber-toothed tiger. The predator was the size of a large lion and lived in North and South America. Homotherium was slightly smaller. Homotherium differs from Smilodon in having shorter fangs and a lighter build. This predator lived in Africa, Eurasia, and North America. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, a species appeared on the continent that people would later call the dire wolf. Canis dirus. The predator was larger and more massive than the gray wolf, one and a half meters long and weighing up to 80 kilograms. Canis dirus had shorter legs and larger teeth. It was a pack predator that hunted very large animals such as horses and bison. Giant beaver Castoroids ohioensis. The length of the beaver reached two and a half meters, and the weight could reach 220 kilograms. In addition to its size, the giant beaver differed from the usual in its narrower tail, similar to the tail of a muskrat, and huge teeth protruding from the gums by almost 15 centimeters. In the skies of Pleistocene America, one could meet teratorns, these are huge vultures, related to modern condors. The wingspan of the largest of them, Argentavis, could reach 8 meters. This is a record among flying birds. However, Argentavis lived in the Miocene. In the Pleistocene, small relatives lived from the genera Teratornis and Iolornis. The wingspan of small vultures could reach only about 5 meters. The lifestyle of teratorns was the same as that of modern vultures and condors, only with the difference that they fed primarily on the corpses of not antelopes and bison, but various thick-skinned giants. Yes, they were elephants and giant sloths. Tenatornas became extinct along with the entire American megafauna about 10,000 years ago, when the animals that provided the food supply for predators became extinct. Ornomegalonyx odoroi, a giant, poorly flying owl. He is about one meter tall and weighs about nine kilograms. This bird became extinct 8,000 years ago. Animals were born, evolved, and died in entire species and families. One of the main factors in the death of entire groups was ice ages. Many animals died during migration and the sudden cooling of the climate. When the herbivores died after them and the predators died of hunger. Any little thing in the history of the Earth is important. Some mammals adapted to extreme cold by developing thicker fur, which served them as better insulation during severe frosts. A time traveler visiting one of the Pleistocene glaciations in the Northern Hemisphere would have seen a frozen world inhabited by many woolly mammals. Among them were woolly rhinoceroses and mammoths, reindeer with very thick fur and shaggy musk oxen. Why were all these animals large? Everything is very simple. The surface area of the body is less than the volume of the body. Small mammals follow this rule. In cold climates, heat in small animals evaporates from the body faster than in large animals, and small animals freeze faster. For larger animals, things are a little different. Typically, larger animals live in cold climates, while their smaller relatives are found in warmer areas of the globe. For example, among bears the largest is the polar bear living in the Arctic. This is one of the largest modern land predators. The weight of a polar bear reaches 650 kilograms. But the Malayan bear from the tropical forests of Southeast Asia weighs about 10 times less than its polar counterpart. 
The small size of the Malayan bear is the result of adaptation to a warm climate. In turn, the polar bear's huge body is better adapted to the harsh polar climate. The height of the woolly mammoth at the shoulder was almost 3 meters. The enormous size of the fossil animal, like its shaggy fur, helped retain heat inside the body in order to survive in the cold north. Mammoths even lived beyond the Arctic Circle. And in Sicily there lived a close relative of the mammoth. This is a dwarf elephant, more than four times smaller in size than its northern counterpart. Perhaps the small body size evolved as a result of life on the island. Due to its height, this small elephant lost significantly more heat than a mammoth, which was not unnecessary in a hot climate. But the African elephant seems to violate this general rule. The African elephant has a huge body and lives in the tropics. But remember about the wide ears of this elephant. Every time an African elephant flaps its ears, its body surface area increases by about 20%. Optical illusion. Have we been lied to all along? Over the course of 37 million years, elephants gradually increased in size. Some species of elephants became the largest land animals of the Quaternary period. Development of a long trunk, huge tusks, and strong molars. This is a result of climate change. During this period, Many different types of lawns who lived on four continents. Elephants that moved to isolated islands eventually became dwarf animals. This happened with stegodons on islands in Indonesia, mammoths on Wrangel Island and the Channel Islands. This happened with elephants on the islands of the Mediterranean Sea. The height of these elephants barely reached one meter. At the beginning of the Pleistocene, Archidiscodon planifrons and the southern elephant Archidiscodon meridionalis grazed peacefully in the forests of Asia and southern Europe. Among these elephants were giants and dwarfs, as well as smooth-skinned and woolly species. The largest elephant of all time was the steppe mammoth Trogontherii, who lived at the end of the Pliocene and beginning of the Pleistocene. The height of this mammoth at the withers reached four and a half meters. This is a full meter taller than the largest African elephant of our time. The tusks of the steppe mammoth grew up to five meters. The woolly mammoth Mammothus primogenius lived in the tundra and was a typical representative of the glacial fauna. The animal was cold-loving. Scientists have often found frozen corpses in the permafrost soils of Siberia. At the opposite end of the scale is a dwarf relative the size of an average pig. During one of the ice ages, the mammoth crossed the ice of the Bering Strait and at the end of the Pleistocene it spread widely throughout North America. The direct ancestor of the woolly mammoth was the Trogontaria elephant, Mammothus trogontherii. This animal lived in the steppes of the Middle Pleistocene. The Trogontherian elephant evolved from the early Pleistocene southern elephant Archidiscodon meridionalis. During the Pleistocene, species of elephants related to the European mammoth lived in North America, including the giant Mammothus imperator and the small elephant Mammothus columbi. It is interesting that the Mastodon, which became extinct in Europe at the end of the Pliocene, survived all ice ages in North America. This species, Mastodon americanus, lived on the American continent just a few thousand years ago and was contemporary with humans. More than 200 Mastodon skeletons have been found in New York State alone. At the end of the Pleistocene, about 8,000 years ago, all mammoths suddenly became extinct. Mammoths alone, naturally, were unable to adapt to a warmer climate after the Great Ice Age had passed. Others may have been exterminated by humans for their meat. Other representatives of proboscis pygmy elephants survived until the beginning of the Holocene. As a result, now, out of all the great diversity of proboscideans, only a few living species can be found. Other heavyweights of the Pleistocene were rhinoceroses. Woolly rhinoceros, Coelodonta antiquitatus the second most famous Pleistocene animal after the mammoth. 
The length of the rhinoceros reached three and a half meters, and the weight was up to three tons. The ancient rhinoceros had two horns on its face. The longest front horn could reach more than one meter in length. An important feature of this species is the long, thick fur of the bird. It's a man of color. Long hair allowed the rhinoceros to survive in northern and central Eurasia, which was inhospitable for heat-loving animals. The woolly rhinoceros lived on cold plains called mammoth steppes. In place of these plains, there are now coniferous and broad-leaved forests. This species became extinct about 10,000 years ago, and possibly later. In the earliest Pleistocene of Europe, Merck's rhinoceroses, Dicerorhinus kirchbergensis, and Elasmotherium grazed in the forests side by side with forest elephants. Merck's rhinoceros apparently descends from the somewhat older Dicerorhinus etruscus. Elasmotherium was truly a gigantic beast. The animal's height reached about two and a half meters, and its weight was up to six tons. There was only one horn on the animal's head, but this horn could supposedly reach up to two meters in length. Both of these animals went extinct before the woolly rhinoceros. However, a number of researchers are confident that relict populations of Elasmotherium and Merck's rhinoceroses survived until the very end of the Pleistocene and met with ancient people. Thank you for watching. The Complete Evolution of Man This video will be dedicated to a very interesting creature called man. Yes. Today we will talk about us and about you. How did we come to be? What were we like before? And how did we become what we are now? More details about everything. There are several versions about the origin of man. First version. If you have your own garden plot, then go there immediately. Find a place where cabbage grows. If you watch cabbage for a long time, you can see how children appear in it. Second version. Somewhere far away, there's a factory for the production of children. If you, for example, need a child, you can write a letter to this plant, and a real stork will bring you the baby. A lot of storks work as couriers transporting children by air. They even made a full-length cartoon about it. Third version. God created man in his own image and likeness. This guy created Adam and Eve. These were the first people. This is a very long story about an apple, about a snake, and there was, um, someone else. In the fourth version, another guy named Darwin decided that people descended from monkeys, which greatly angered God's supporters. There are also several other theories that aliens created humans. People came from the sun, from grass, and so on. Personally, I like the version that the first people were real giants, up to seven meters tall. Giants appeared from the union of gods and angels. This theory is based on ancient images of bats and controversial finds of huge humanoid skeletons. Over time, the gods stopped visiting the earth, and the giant people degenerated. In this episode, we will show you the complete evolution of man. Let's go! At first, our ancestors were bacteria. Then fish. Then fish with legs. Then lizards. Then mice. Then squirrels. And so on. We want to tell you about the long and complete chain of human evolution. And we'll start with small bacteria. According to scientists, 530 million years ago, one of the first living creatures called Pacaya appeared. The average size of this small animal was only four centimeters or one and a half inches. The body of the human ancestor was elongated and compressed at the sides. Pacaya's head was small, with two tentacles similar to the horns of a snail. The horns were probably used as an instrument of touch. It is very important to note one thing. Scientists find only very close relatives of the transitional form, 
which by default is considered a distant ancestor of humans. Pakaia is only a contender for the role of great-grandmother of Homo sapiens, or a creature probably extremely similar to a human ancestor. The most important part of Pakaia's body is considered to be the notochord. This is the spine that this creature had, the same as in humans, but much smaller in size. Gradually, the notochord in such animals was overgrown, first with cartilage, and then with bones. A new round of evolution has occurred, and Arandaspis appeared. This creature was no longer Pakaya, but it has not yet become a fish. These small animals reached a length of 35 centimeters and are considered the oldest of the vertebrates, which already had a skeleton made of minerals. Arandaspis remains have been found in Australia, South America, and the Arabian Peninsula. After the analyses, scientists came to the conclusion that these remains are between 470 and 480 million years old. Arandaspis were slightly more fish-like than their worm-like ancestors. The head of these creatures was covered with a shell consisting of many scales and extending into the back. Under the head there was also a small and thin armored shield but the tail remained mobile to escape from malicious predators. For example, from nautiloids, which could reach nine and a half meters in length, or approximately 32 feet long. Arandaspis were the first of the creatures that had small records. In the future, as a result of evolution, these plates will become real full-fledged teeth. The exoskeleton of Arandaspis was well-developed but inside this failed fish was soft like a meat stew. And this creature is called coelacanth. Scientists consider coelacanth not only to be a transitional link from a half fish to a real fish. This amazing species of ancient inhabitants of the oceans is called the fish that conquered time. 500 million years ago, coelacanths inhabited the aquatic part of the earth in large numbers. For a long time it was believed that they disappeared from our planet approximately 66 million years ago. However, in 1938, a living specimen was miraculously discovered. This amazing find became a super sensation in the scientific world. Today there are two species from this order, which are called coelacanths. It is a large fish that can reach 2 meters in length and weigh up to 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. The lifespan of modern coelacanths is more than 100 years. The coelacanth is a deep sea fish that is difficult to observe in its natural habitat. To study this interesting fish, researchers use underwater cameras and apparatus. This has led to some interesting discoveries. For example, it has been observed that coelacanths not only swim in the water column, but sometimes walk along the seabed using their fleshy fins, which is a rare behavior in fish. These fish walk. Incredible. By the way, do you know why we move our arms when we walk? Our brain and body thus try to perform a gait like four-legged animals do. Another interesting fish is called Chictalic. Chictalic lived 395 million years ago, and this fish had paws. Real paws that left real footprints on the sea sand. Reconstructing the stride from these tracks allowed scientists to conclude that the animal moved by bending its body from side to side. Approximately how a salamander does it. There are no traces of tail dragging. This means that the sacrum and girdle of the hind limbs have already been formed. All these signs allowed scientists to say quite confidently that these were traces of tetrapods. It can also be assumed that the most ancient tetrapods which walked on four legs, lived not in fresh waters, but in salt waters. It was this discovery that could confound the entire theory of evolution. Because scientists do not understand what this theory makes us think about the order in which life came to land. 
but these are only details of evolution that cannot cast doubt on the main and popular theory. And our task is to show you the theory of human evolution as accurately as possible. 375 million years ago Devonian fish went crazy we didn't climb onto land. These fish gradually ceased to have enough air in the water. And these fish were forced to invent lungs, which replaced their gills when the water went into the sand. By the way, fish necks appeared at the same time. So that the unfortunate ancestors, squelching in the drying mud, could reach up and grab air. Chictalic also had cervical vertebrae and ribs. 10 million years. This is a very long period of time. But it took exactly 10 million years for the next link of human ancestors to appear. Ichthyostegalia began to walk through the Devonian swamps. These were the first amphibians, from which reptiles would later descend. And even later, mammals will evolve from reptiles. But we will not rush the story of the great evolution. So, here is an ancient reptile that lived 315 million years ago. Gylonomus. A small lizard measuring 20 centimeters or almost 8 inches long. This is one of the first lizards that refused to live in the water element. This creature, like all the first reptiles, laid offspring in water, but was itself independent of water. Reptiles divided into two large groups. These are amphibians and amniotes. Amphibians remained forever tied to water. And amniotes became the direct ancestors of mammals. Some more time passed. A large group of animals appear on Earth. Cynodonts. This was the transitional link from reptiles to mammals. These animals carried eggs, but were already covered with hair and reached large sizes. Some cynodont species were massively built and could grow up to 2 meters in length or up to 6 and a half feet in length. Mammals began to evolve. The reptiles didn't stop there either. Some creatures from reptiles began to evolve. Some crazy reptile decided to stand on its hind legs and gradually began to turn into the first dinosaur. Some of the first dinosaurs could even reach decent speed. By the way, cynodonts were not yet true mammals. The era of gigantism flourished. Mammals were smaller than dinosaurs. All the top of the food chain were conquered by dinosaurs. Mammals had to stay in the shadows. Most dinosaurs were diurnal. Therefore, mammals had to move and feed at night. This explains the reason why mammalian vision perceives a combination of only two colors. Birds have surpassed mammals, dinosaurs, and even as humans in terms of vision. Birds' vision allows us to see our world more colorful and picturesque. But mammals have another advantage. This is the sense of smell. By the way, it was from the olfactory lobes of the brain that the cerebral hemispheres, responsible for our intellect, subsequently developed. 160 million years ago, nature created the first place food mammal. It was the ancient rat Uramaya. It is the first known mammal to grow a placenta. The mammalian placenta allows the growth of a full-fledged fetus. This is Purgatorius. This creature also resembles either a mouse or a squirrel. But it was Purgatorius that is considered the first known primate. The first primate lived 66 million years ago. By this time, flowering plants had already appeared on Earth, which gave the world nectar, juicy fruits, fragrant flowers, and, therefore, swarms of insects. All this delicious and buzzing menu had to be eaten by someone. This someone became the primatomorphs. For this reason, the ancestors of people even learned not only to actively climb trees, but also to jump. 
The sizes of primatomorphs were small and therefore the animals could easily and quickly hide from any predator in dense vegetation. The survival rate of the first primates was high. These little creatures were unpretentious in food and could eat anything. Omnivorousness contributed to the development of intelligence. At the same time, dinosaurs were actively dying out. If this had not happened, it is unlikely that the ancestors of people would have received evolutionary development. Purgatorius were fearless jumpers and jumped great distances. Such jumps developed the vestibular apparatus of our ancestors, which stimulated the development of neural connections in the brain. But in order to actively jump through trees and look into the distance, it is better to have eyes not on the sides of your head, but in front. So, our eyes began to move closer to each other. Another acquisition from those times. This is a grasping brush. With the help of a grasping brush, you can tenaciously hold onto branches. This can be done by both adults and cubs, who hold onto the mother's fur while jumping. After the extinction of the dinosaurs for two million years, primatomorphs became the most successful group of mammals on the planet. These creatures had no serious enemies until large birds of prey appeared. Archisebus appeared 55 million years ago. The small animal weighed only 30 grams, or less than one ounce. The length of Archisebus was 7 centimeters or 2 and a half inches. This creature strongly resembled a modern tarsia. Archisebus was a transitional form between the dry-nosed monkeys and the dry-nosed primates. The change in the shape of our nose begins with our long-heeled ancestors. Separating the nose from the mouth contributed to better development of facial expressions. But this creature already really looks like a small monkey in the form in which contemporaries are accustomed to imagine it. This is Egyptopithecus. The creature already looks like a small monkey in the form in which we are accustomed to modern primates. Egyptopithecus lived 30 million years ago. The weight of the animal was about 6 kilograms. Egyptopithecus had a large snout and a long tail. He ate plant foods and led a diurnal lifestyle. Sedanius. This monkey was the size of a baboon and weighed 20 kilograms. The creature lived in a humid, warm forest 28 million years ago. Sedanius marks the separation of the ape species from the hominoid species. This was the last ancestor that had features of both. At that time, our forefathers will finally part with their monkey past. In the 18th and 19th centuries, all chimpanzee performers in the circus had a name that was popular at the time, Proconsul. Scientists took this name as a basis and named the progenitor of the chimpanzee Proconsul. This means a monkey that lived before the chimpanzee. Proconsuls and related species existed not only before the appearance of chimpanzees, but also other great apes. Primates lived 25 million years ago. During this period of time, most species of apes lost their tails. The tail is convenient for holding onto branches, but only if you are small. Proconsuls are also considered the last common ancestors separating humans from chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. Afterwards, our paths with the orangutans will diverge forever. About 10 million years ago, the ancestors of gorillas and chimpanzees separated from the human lineage. Macalopithecus appeared. The appearance of this creature is unknown due to the scarcity of finds. Most likely, Macalopithecus walked on four limbs, climbed trees and ate seeds and nuts, as evidenced by a thick layer of enamel on the teeth. Scientists believe that Macalopithecus africa was similar to Aurinopithecus, which lived 8 million years ago in northern Greece. Aurinopithecus had a large and wide face with rectangular eye orbits, rather large body sizes and prominent fangs and nails. But Aurinopithecus was not our ancestor. 
and the existence in Africa about 8 million years ago of Macalopithecus and others like it proves that human ancestors came from Africa. Sahelanthropus This is the most controversial creature from the point of view of paleoanthropologists. Scientists were divided into two camps and are still arguing. Did Sahelanthropus walk on two legs or move on four? Sahelanthropus had a large brain, like that of modern chimpanzees or four times smaller than that of humans. When the remains of a creature named Ororan, who lived six million years ago, were found in Kenya in 2000, Newspapers immediately dubbed him Millennium Man. In the local dialect, the word Ororan also sounds pathetic, first man. Most scholars believe Ororan is definitely our ancestor, although there are those who doubt it. What did Ororan look like? Looks just like a monkey. Ororan had small teeth relative to the size of his body. The creature had a rounded head and an elongated neck. The next evolutionary step was Ardipithecus. The human ancestor lived on Earth for four years about a million years ago. Ardipithecus was already upright or was approaching this type of locomotion. These creatures also had very long arms reaching to their knees. Walking on two legs was a necessary element of the great ape. In the forests, these monkeys did not need to move on their hind limbs. The main means of transportation were hands. But when the forests began to turn into savannas, the need for walking increased many times over. Firstly, primates, when in open areas, often rose on their hind legs to observe a predator or find something interesting. Secondly, moving on four legs in hot climates always expends more energy than moving on two legs. Less area of the moving body means less heating of the body itself. It was due to the heating of the body that the long, thick fur turned into short and thin. Lush hair remained only on the head to protect this head from deadly ultraviolet radiation. Primates no longer needed to hold onto tree branches with their hands or run through trees with their hands. Nature has found another use for the hands of the future man. These were stones that flew into the heads of evil predators, and then into the victims. Three and a half million years ago the first tools appeared. Why were these weapons needed? Such primitive tools made it easier to butcher prey and scrape meat from bones and eating meat helped the brain grow. The making of tools itself, as well as the increasingly complex communication of our ancestors, necessary for effective hunting, also helped the brain grow. Australopithecus afarensis The famous skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis was found in 1974 in Ethiopia. Scientists named the discovery Lucy in honor of the girl whom the famous Beatles sang in one of their songs. Lucy was an upright creature who lived in what is now Ethiopia three million years ago. The arms were shorter than those of Artipithecus, and the pelvis was already very similar to a human one. After all, almost no one doubts that we originated from these creatures. Australopithecines walked on two legs but were covered with hair. The height did not exceed one and a half meters or five feet. Weight reached 55 kilograms or 121 pounds. Australopithecines walked on slightly bent legs and had curved fingers and toes, with hips resembling those of a chimpanzee. Australopithecus collected plant food and probably already knew how to make simple tools from wood and stone, but not for hunting but in order to separate meat from the bones of animals killed by predators. Australopithecus probably ate carrion and finished off others. But future people lived in families in which there was one main male and several females. Homo habilis or Homo habilis lived one and a half million years ago. Name he became the first to regularly use tools and it was with him that the rapid growth of the brain began. 
His body is already much more human-like than that of Australopithecines, but his face is not yet very much. Although the size of the jaws and teeth has already become smaller, and the brain has become larger. In appearance, Habilis still somewhat resembled Australopithecus. The structure of the larynx shows that the Habilis could not yet pronounce as many sounds as we pronounce. However, they probably already had the rudiments of speech. Homo erectus or Homo erectus appeared, who lived 800,000 years ago. It was then that these demi-humans probably tried to use fire for the first time. Outwardly, they were already noticeably similar to us, and their brain volume was slightly smaller than ours. Homo erectus already lived in caves, used wooden spears and sometimes cooked food over fire. The erectuses were still low, only one and a half meters in height. Their body was similar to ours, except with more developed hair, but the facial features still remained rather archaic. Homo erectus were engaged in gathering, eating roots, berries, and other gifts of the plant world. But periodically they went out hunting. Carrion was no longer the main meat diet. The remains of rhinoceroses, elephants, giraffes, and hippos were found near their fire pits. Erectus were capable of hunting very large prey. These people were constantly in danger. This circumstance forced the first people to unite into large family groups. These communities lived in small settlements. Research shows that the settlements were permanent. Heidelberg Man Heidelberg people of Africa 500,000 years ago. Some scientists believe that these people already knew how to build primitive huts. By historical standards, there was very little time left before the emergence of Homo sapiens. And he appeared. According to various estimates, this happened from 200 to 45,000 years ago. The Heidelberg people were tall, almost like us. Males reached 175 centimeters in height or 68 inches. Women were up to 150 centimeters or 59 inches tall. The men weighed about 62 kilograms or 136 pounds. And the women's weight was 51 kilograms or 112 pounds. The structure of the ear shows that they had approximately the same auditory sensitivity as modern people, so they could distinguish many different sounds. It is also shown that they were right-handed. They knew how to make high-quality tools, but no traces of any art were found among them. Neanderthals and other founders of the human race were not included in the evolution of modern man due to complete extinction. But there are still many mysteries to be solved in order to fully understand the history of our land. Thanks for watching our release until the end. Give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And also click on the bell so you don't miss new and interesting releases from the Real Unreal channel.